So basically, this is D and D five. The premise of the of the game basically is it's a world where the undead about a hundred years ago the undead um, basically rose up um, and attacked all of the living people across the, the the continent. Now that worked out differently for different different places. Some of the cities that had a very uh, religious population with a lot of temples and churches survived quite well. Others, smaller hamlets, villages were taken over. Eventually, the the dreadlords, so the the people who are like the likes and the um, vampires and the, and the people who were try, sort of organizing this and and caused this to happen, started making offers to some of the towns that as long as they paid tribute to the them, they would be allowed to to survive, and the dreadlords would actually protect the towns from the undead population. So on the map, you'll notice on the far right-hand side, there's a blue-colored town and then a series of watchtowers. That's the border limits of the the nearest sort of, of the undead-controlled towns. Now, there was a covenant made between the undead cities and the, the people that managed to survive without any influence because trade still had to prosper. Merchants were still required to move back and forwards. So there's kind of an uneasy peace going at the moment. The undead tend to roam the countryside, but they act almost like in a zombie state. So um, in the day, for example, they're very weak. So I know this is just like normal undead, so like zombies. Ghouls tend to go under night, uh, under um, underground during the day. But like if, they, if you were to attack a zombie during the day, you'd have advantage against it because it's lethargic. It's just kind of standing in a field, not really doing anything, waiting for night to come. At night, they become a lot more active, but they're the, the scholars of the cities have worked out a warding system where they can carve magical wards around buildings or even temporary wards that they can put around campsites that will then keep the undead away. Now, that will work for the sort of weaker undead, but it's untested against anything stronger. So it might not necessarily work against a vampire or, or a like, but it, would, it's, it handles against the, the normal undead. The biggest threat at night is the spirits, because the spirits of the dead people appear out of the ground at night and will often attack um, anyone who's not protected in a, one of these protected cities or in a protected campsite. So that's primarily what the people use the warding for, is to protect from the spirits. Um, you guys are in the city marked with the red, um, the red circle. Um, and basically, you've you've been there for some time, so it's one of the biggest cities. You've you're kind of adventurers, but you're out of work at the moment. There's not much work going on. We're kind of in the summer period. Um, there's not a huge amount of activity in the in the areas where you would you'd be normally looking for merchant caravans or similar. There's not been any significant caravans looking for people for weeks, because you guys are quite experienced. You're level five characters. Um, you could take jobs, but those jobs aren't really paying very much compared to what you're used to. So you've been kind of skirting around the the stuff which doesn't pay particularly well. So at the start of it, um, Brunhilda and Dragon, you guys are both sitting at a, a table in a kind of like in an adventurer's tavern. And you're... Uh, so Dragon, you're kind of sitting at a table in the back, whereas Brunhilda's up on the like, little stage playing. Um, being a bard, and you're kind of just entertaining this crowd. Now you're in um, the, a tavern called the Hope and Glory, which is basically an adventurer's tavern. So this is sort of the sort of place that people hang out looking for work. There's one or two other people kicking around, but it's in the middle of the day, so it's quite quiet. Um, there's a lunchtime crowd of just sort of normal um, townspeople in, and, and that's who are being entertained by the bard. Um, Avinda, you're sort of meditating. You're in the fighting pit in the city. You're kind of sitting alone in this sort of sanded off pit um, just really meditating and practicing your moves. There's no fights or bouts on at the moment. That stuff tends to happen in the evening, but you're just using this opportunity to um, practice and to, to get some peace and quiet. And uh, Alex, you want to change your characters, your nameplate to your character's name, please. How do you do that? Uh, little cog in the top right-hand corner. It'll say display name. Oh, Just change yeah. it and then press save name. Um, so Quell, you're in the local. You're in basically what's called the Grand, Grand Library. So the city has quite a large library. Now there's normally only 
it's quite restricted access. There's only people like clerics, wizards, al alchemists, those sort of people are allowed in. There's quite a hefty membership fee to get into the library. Have I, uh, have I paid my membership fee? Yes. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, the, the, the church that you serve effectively has paid on behalf of its members so that any of its members can use the library as where, as and when required. So you're basically just studying some, some books, reading up on some research. Um, so back at the inn, the thing that disturbs you most is that the, the door sort of slams open and this small child, probably about eight, um, rushes in basically and he, he turns, looks around the whole of the inn and he sees this big notice board on the side of the wall of the inn and he literally turns to, to you, Matty, and looks at you and then points at the stool. Is anyone sitting here? Um, no. And he, he grabs the stool over and pu pulls it noisily across towards the wall, steps up onto the stool and starts hammering this notice into the notice board with like a little mallet and some big iron nails. Okay. And, I'll stand up and go have a look at the notice anyway. So you go over and have a look at this notice. So about sort of 10 minutes later, um, the same boy arri uh, arrives at the, um, the, the pit, basically, the training pit. And similarly, there's a board there with people that might be interested in particular fighters. So if someone's looking for fighters, they'll generally advertise at the at the fighting pit. So again, this this small child appears and basically starts hammering this uh, the, it, this uh, message into this notice board. Now there's no stool or anything for him to stand on, so he basically has to hammer it in at quite a low level. And it literally hangs off the bottom of the board and sways in the wind. So Avinda kind of uh, acknowledges the sounds of the hammering, but continues to wait until his meditation is completely finished before slowly rising to his feet and wandering over to have a look. Yeah, so you know, you, you notice the sound of the hammers, but you just blocked it out temporarily, but then you still can recall it when you go back. Now, at the um, the library, it's slightly different. Basically, this, this child rushes in, uh, and he's quite... He's, you're quite far away from him initially, Alex. Um, he kind of rushes in, and you can see there's like a, a sort of old librarian who would normally be checking people's memberships, who's who basically surprised by this child, literally just rushes in, and then start he starts hobbling on this with his walking cane after this child, uh, and the child just gets to a centre pillar of the um, in the library basically, and and starts nailing into this centre pillar this message before he, he literally turns around and runs off before he can get grabbed by the librarian. Uh, I'm going to go and look over as soon as he's caused such a ruckus and see what it says. So the poster reads, Heroes Wanted. Excellent pay weight awaits skilled individuals with strong morals and good constitution. Contact Thomas at the Callistro Warehouses on Breaker Street for more information. So initially, it kind of excites Avinder. So things have been quiet for too long, and there's a sense that I could do some good here. And it kind of immediately sort of mentalised that checklist. I'm going to definitely go and check this out, but not before I finish training. Mm -hmm. Cool. So Matt, you see the same message on the notice board at the inn. Cool. Is there like a date or anything, or just like as soon as? Uh, it doesn't seem to say. It doesn't seem to have a date on it. Um, I suspect, given the um, the speed at which it was delivered, um, it's probably something which is time dependent. But these sort of things would generally generally have a couple of days to sort stuff out. Okay. Um, G generally, they would send someone around to pick up the posters afterwards once they've found however many people that they might need. Okay, um, I'm going to leave and then head over to this. How uh, was the location it mentions then? What are you doing about Brunhilda? Who? I'm going to like follow him, but like not let on what's going on because I've got no idea what he's up to. So I'm curious, but so do you guys know each other or not? No, no, I don't think so. Right. So you, it's just obviously because of the patron thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're not aware of the fact that you're. No. I'm, because of my role with my patron, I'm aware of others, but not really who they are and what they're what they're up to per se, other than just right. sort of things they've done. 
So, so one thing you guys both hear when the the kid is um, hammering up the posters is, and it almost puts you off your um, playing. But the hell that is, you, you do hear the voice of your patron in your heads, both of you, saying you should really check that out. And then there's just like an ominous silence. Have Brunhendler and Dragon got the same patron? Yeah. 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 Okay. Obviously, you guys don't know that, but uh... neither do we. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, so, uh, Quail, what are you doing? Uh, I'm going to look at the. Obviously, I'm going to look at the poster. And then I'm just going to screw it up and throw it in the bin because I don't really consider myself a hero. But I've got more than enough work. Cool. So you you um, you screw it up basically, and you drop it in the bin. Yep. Um, what you so basically, dragon? You arrive. Uh, you kind of it takes you about an hour probably to find this place. It's not particularly well marked, uh, and you've not really been down into this part of the city before. A lot of parts of the city seems to be it's um, like workers' yards and uh, timber merchants and things like that. And eventually, you find this um, this warehouse with a sign over it that says um, Callisto, uh, Callisto Warehouses or Callisto uh, the Callisto Warehouse. Um, Ollie, how stealth? I mean, when you're following um, Matt's character, how stealthy do you want to be about that? Oh, it's gone. Very stealthy, apparently. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, Matt, you make a perception roll to see if you notice the fact that you're being followed. Actually, it'll be your, it'll be your um, passive perception. That's a 13. Right, so... Wait for Ollie to come back. No. I think he's just reconnecting. Yeah. There you go. Sorry about that. It's okay. So, Ollie, you're following um, Matt's character towards this warehouse. Make a stealth check to see if Matt notices he is being followed. And it's just in the scales. Yep. Yeah, so you basically keep blended into the crowd, and eventually he it, take, it takes him a few, about an hour or so to find this place, and he has to ask a few times. But eventually, you you end up in this workers' this district of the of the city, and there's a big sign over this um, quite large warehouse that just says the Callisto Warehouse. Um, okay. Anyway, I'm going to have a quick look around um, to make sure I'm not being followed. I'm just going to head inside. Cool. Make a perception check, uh, Matt and Brunhilda. Do I need to be perception or self check here? Perception. That's well. Some pretty, pretty shit perception, guys. Yeah, <laughs> if only we had advantage. <laughs> so you guys, uh, you guys wonder in. Uh, well, I mean, do you want to wonder in? Oh, I'm going in. Yeah. So you basically you, you push your way past in into this the sort of courtyard of this warehouse, and there's it's all bustle basically. So there's there's carts arriving constantly being unloaded by workers. Um, there's like various piles of supplies being transferred to other piles which are already set up inside the actual the compounds. So things like uh, big masonry blocks, um, large pieces of timber. Um, there's, there's like a food cart that comes in with barrels of apples and um, ale barrels on it. And there's like, there's people sort of running around directing different teams of workers to move stuff in and out. You can also see that there's a number of workers who are tending some large cart horses that have been stabled off to one side. And others seem to be preparing what looks like tools into like um, crates, uh, as well as getting supplies ready. And you can see what, you, what looks like folded up tents. And there's also a solid wooden coach that stands out in the actual courtyard. It's um, a really expensive looking dark wood and it's covered in intricate wooden carvings. You also notice that it seems to be covered in wards as well. Um, it's currently being washed down by a boy. Um, 
There's no, it's not a state, it's not um, a hitched up to a horse or anything at the moment. Okay. Does it look like there's anyone sort of in charge, like issuing orders or anything like that? Yeah, so there's a you, you can see sort of like in the in, almost in the back center of the uh, the courtyard area, there's a large table set up, and there's a, a sort of late middle aged man standing behind it, and he's basically gesturing to different work teams as they come over and sending them direct off to different directions and different tasks. Okay. Just um, as you just as you're doing that, um, uh, you, you you sort of you turn around and you see a. Uh, a slightly uh, sweaty, panting um, character sort of enter the, the courtyard as well. Do you want to describe yourself? Yeah, so as kind of Avender uh, sort of makes its way up into the courtyard, you can see sort of these long flowing orange robes, uh, which look pretty comfy with their bagginess. And he's got a quarter staff that he's almost using as a walking stick to propel himself forward even faster. Um, he's got a... Um, sort of like a, a big top knot uh, and he's got reasonably dark skin and he's got quite a bit of a, a sweat on at the moment as it looks like he's gotten there quite quickly. Okay. Um, I guess I'll nod to him but then make my way over to the guy that looked like he was in charge. Sure. And he acknowledges you back. What does your character look like, Matty? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, sort of... Like smallish stature, um, wearing like sort of quite heavily plated armor. Um, tends to always wear a helmet, so you can't necessarily see his face at the moment. Cool. Right, you you wander over to the the guy that looks like he's in charge, um, and he, he he finishes giving some orders, and you you hear you hear him sort of saying to the workman, basically, um, he's basically saying. We need to get this. We need to get this loaded up. The 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 Baron wants to leave tomorrow, uh, and he he directs them away basically. And then you, you see the head off starting to move up some of the piles of stuff which has been unloaded onto a different set of much sturdier looking uh, wagons that are at the back of the where the sort of courtyard area that seem to be obviously belong to the 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 warehouse itself. He, he looks up and he, he first thing he notices straight away is your armor, and he sort of like. He says, well, you're not wearing the guard's uniform, so I assume you hear about the job. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll take off my helmet and just start inquiring about work. been a bit quiet recently, so I'm jumping at the first chance, I guess. He sort of looks, he goes, well, we only sent the boy out uh, less than an hour ago. Um, if you don't mind waiting over there, I just want to see how many other people arrive before I introduce you to the Baron. Saves time if we can do this in one go. So okay. at this point, I'll probably choose to appear from whatever crates whatever I've been hiding behind so far and just watching what's been going on. Yeah. Um, introduce myself to uh, the guy who's obviously in charge of it all. Yeah, the guy the guy introduces himself as Thomas. Okay. And he um he sort of he looks at you and goes, Bard, because you can see the musical yep. instrument, obviously. Yes, of sorts. Hmm. Well, I'm sure you'll be useful. Uh, perhaps you could um, wait with um, this. Uh, and he sort of like says, "Sorry, I didn't catch your name." Uh, no, <laughs> 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 he points it. Uh, I'm Dargan. Yeah, and then he, he notices you standing behind them as well, um, Avinda. Yeah, and he's uh, sort of stride up, um, still with this kind of quite quick pace. And you sort of, as he reaches, he goes. I uh, feel I'm slightly too late then. It looks as though the job is already assigned. And he sort of looks at you, no, no, um, the Baron's after four or five good people. Ah, then perhaps I'm in good faith today then. And he sort of, uh, he, he gestures to like a, a bench um, where some of the workmen have kind of been um, waiting uh, sort of for orders or, or taking a break basically. He says, uh, how, if you could wait over there, I'll um, give it another hour, see if anyone else turns up, and then I'll introduce you to the barman. Uh, there's there's drinks behind the um, on on the barrel. Help yourself. And he kind of uh, having to sort of walks over, and it takes him almost too long to decide where to sit. Um, sort of moving places, and uh, just seems a little bit odd. So the three of you are currently sitting on the bench. Yeah, just as close as physically possible to where I am. Just ignoring the man that seems to be taking too long. 
But like or anything better to you, I'm just going to start performing. Make a performance roll. Yay. What are you singing? Just out uh, of interest. A tale about the shepherd that could. Oh, okay. Oh, and it is awful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I heard this one at the end yesterday. It was not good. <laughs> so the... Um, you start playing basically, and a, a few of the <laughs> a few a few of the workers start sort of turning to to listen, um, and the the foreman sort of turns to you, the top of the and says, um, "If you'd mind keeping that down, please. I I need these guys to be working." I want to play even louder. Make a performance roll. Make a performance roll with disadvantage. Well. Um... So how do joins just roll? You oh, just, it always rolls twice. You, you, it? Yeah, you just roll and use the yeah. lowest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same. So he sort of he, he sort of turns round to you and goes, "If you don't stop playing, I'll have you escorted out of the compound." <laughs> stop playing very promptly. <laughs> Good. Sounds like uh, suppression with your freedom of speech, there, mate. <laughs> So after after about an hour, he sort of um, he says, "Wait here, I'll be I'll be back in a second. And he he goes inside, and he comes back a couple of minutes later. And he says, "Yeah, the Baron will see you now. If you follow me, please." And he, he leads you into the warehouse, uh, to an office at the back of the warehouse. And there's a quite a young um, guy sitting in this warehouse. He's probably in his early twenties, and he's he's sitting in an office, um, and he's basically studying a series of maps and comparing them to much older looking map. And he um, he gestures for you to to sit down if you wish. There's there's various chairs scattered amongst the office. Uh, yeah, I'll go sit on the one closest to him, I guess. Stay quite, standing. Yeah, quite interested. Uh, Avender sort of gets quite close, um, without sort of being rude, as close to the table. Yeah, so as you can. can see that there's there's a fairly modern map of the area. Um, but there's also a much older map of the area that shows all of the towns and cities in full state of repair. And the map also has a, um, like a sort of Pegasus heraldry on it. And you notice that the, the Baron guy's wearing a similar like um, sash with a like, Pegasus symbol on it. Um, he basically, he, he sort of turns to you and says, hello, my name is Erwood Callisto. Thank you for responding so promptly to my request for assistance. I've recently been in touch with the Duke and we've agreed that despite myself being a bastard, he's willing to allow me access to my ancestral lands provided I can secure them and start a reasonable amount of food production. As you may be aware, the city is suffering or will be suffering very shortly from a lack of uh, food. The crops haven't been great. The farmland across the land that we can still control is weaker than the farmland in other areas. And it's important that we re-establish a foothold on the village that I grew up in. Seems very reasonable of the Duke, considering. Where are these lands, as in? Are they past the point of the um, agreement, if you will? No, and he, he draws out um, he draws out a map basically, and he sort of says um, the the village we're talking about is here. So it's a small village called Estfield. How long a journey is that? Um, it's difficult to say. And he pulls out a pair of um, not protractors, but you know what I mean the the two the, the sort of measuring things and he basically says that the, what he seems to estimate is the time to the first in here is about a day and then it's about two days to here so that's three another day to a city called um carrig or a town called carrig so that's four and then he reckons it's two days up to the village so six okay So, what sort of pay are we looking at for this, and what work is going to be required of us when we get to the village? Within the forehand. 
we're not quite sure what state the village is in. I've got messages back from some of my men, and he, he sort of like sort of uh, shows you some messages, and he's he, he's going to let you you sort of look at them later. The village seems to be in a reasonable state, or at least the inn is in a reasonable state of repair. This is the second expedition I'll be sending. The first expedition is already there, started the repairs. They believe it's now safe for me to undertake the expedition as well. So I need some guards. Uh, along, I'll be taking four of my normal household guards with me, but I need some slightly more capable individuals in case we encounter something unforeseen. Ideally, um, I would like you to stay with us there initially um, while we get the, make the village secure. I'm willing to offer you 500 gold each for the journey and for spending at least two weeks with us at the village to handle any situations that arise. And if you're willing to stay on on a retainer basis, I will also grant you some land in the actual village itself where you could build your own house should you choose to. Okay. So, it's, I mean, from your experience, the offer is very generous. When did you last hear from your um, men already there? Ah, let's let me um, read the letters to you. So he basically pulls out a letter. Um, if I do this, it should make the letter appear to everyone. Mm -hmm. So it reads, "My lord, we have reached the village with little incident. The undead in the area are passive, and your guards have easily dispatched the few we encountered. I'm afraid the village has not fared well. The inn remains the only significant structure standing. The stone ground floor has survived, but the remains of the upper wooden floor will need to be dismantled and reconstructed. I've assigned a team to this already. The other buildings are ruins and will need to be cleared before we can be begin rebuilding them. Outside of the village, the small church on the hill has survived, but given the undead in the grounds, it's likely to need reconsecrated." We've established a tented camp and watered the perimeter. We have supplies to last a month and have established trade orders with the nearby town of Carrick. More worryingly, we found recent evidence of someone living in the inn, perhaps in the last two to three months. It was clear they had, it was clear they had left some time ago as their supplies were rotten, but they did leave a number of alchemical tools behind. I will send messages back fortnightly with the fortnightly supply car. And he basically says that was four weeks ago. Okay. And then his most recent letter. Reads, my lord, I forget to inform you that one of the Mason's apprentices, a 14-year boy called Cobb, has went missing. The boy was not used to being out of the city, and it's possible he did not heed our warnings and left the safety of the wards to relieve himself. We searched for the boy in the surrounding area, but no sign of the, no sign of the boy or any recent evidence of undactivity was found. Regretfully, we gave up the search to continue working on the village, but we do send out at least one patrol a day in case he is simply lost. The work on the inn proceeds well, and we should be finished in the week. The inn is being warded by the warder and should be helped form a safe base of operations. I feel it is now safe for you to join us at the village. We are receiving regular supplies from Carrick, but could do with lo loads of hardwood, timber, and cut stone to speed up the repair process. Signed, Ager. Uh, he says Ager's um, one of his most trusted employees. Um, he sent him with the gun. So that was about two weeks ago that that letter was received. So are you expecting another letter soon, or...? Uh, yes, po possibly within the next week or so. Um, it may well be that we, we um, intercept the messenger on the on the road, in which case we can ask. If not, um, we'll either have to go up to the village, or it could be that the uh, message will be left in Carrick for us. Okay. Okay. Um, would it be a good idea to maybe take a cleric with us so we can consecrate the church grounds? Ah, he says. It's a good idea and uh, something I've already thought of. And he basically hands out a letter and he, he hands it to you. I can see from your um, your garb, you're uh, a paladin of, of, of the order. And he hands you this um, this letter. This letter is addressed to the abbot of one of the local churches. Um, I've asked him for his assistance in sending one of his um, novates or one of his uh, priests along with us. Mm -hmm. um, if you could deliver the letter to the abbot, um, perhaps while you're going back to your inn to settle your accounts before you join us in this adventure, then um, I'm sure that the abbot will arrange for one of his uh, clerics to come with us. Okay, no problem. <clears throat> Looking around, kind of, Avender sort of counts the number of people there quite slowly um, before turning back to the, the main person and says, well, how, why do you need so many people? It seems as though there's not been much violence, but you need such an escort? 
it's dangerous times. We are on the border of, of the territory. Um, I would just feel happier if I had someone more competent than my than my my guards. I mean, not to say that they're incompetent, but they're cheap, and they they can handle most things. Um, but if, for example, we were attacked by bandits, I'm not sure how they would fare if there's only four of them. I would feel better with a more experienced group who can handle every eventuality that might come up. You kind of notice that the the mention of bandits, there's kind of quite a, a bit of a grin and excitement on uh, Avinder's lips. So just out of context, but like how, like, because obviously you've got the undead roaming like day and night, etc., with them being more prolific at night, but how has that affected like banditry, etc.? Um, I mean, it's it's affected it a fair amount, but there is still there's still people who are who are willing to take the risk. Now, most caravans are going to travel during the day, so you're more likely to be attacked during the day. And bandits would ward their camps the same way that the villagers are warded. So, one of the reasons why there's very little magic weaponry or magic armor in the in the in the realm is one: the undead stamped out magical um, weapons. They actually in the undead lands, magical weapons are effectively on pain of death unless you're one of their servants because the magic weapons have such a high effect against undead creatures. Now, in the normal lands where obviously undead, uh, magical weapons would be of great use, unfortunately, the alchemists needed the magical weapons to be able to spelt them down to create the ink that's used in the wards. So a lot of the original magical weapons were had to be quickly um, sort of destroyed in order to create this warding capability to allow them to, to ward the walls and, and settlements, etc. But you can also buy like portable wards. So it might be like a little sort of wooden chain linked set of wards where the ward plates are on the sort of like wooden lacquered plates, maybe one plate every meter or so. So you can wrap those round horses and campsites, etc. Is there a lot of sale in like fake wards, portable wards? Not, re not really. Most people, um, most e even normal people, have a certain amount of experience in spotting wards because they're so prevalent. So, if anyone was caught trying to sell something like that, it would be like a high crime. So, yeah, there probably is situations where maybe someone tries it on and sells fake wards, but it's certainly not common. Okay. So. Um, the Baron mentions he would like to leave at first light tomorrow. So if you'd like to, he, he says there's still some light outside if you need to pick up any supplies yourselves or if you want to uh, settle up with your inns, etc. and um, meet me here tomorrow at first light. Okay, and I'll take my leave. Yep, he gives you a purse of 100 gold coins each as your initial um, stipend effectively. Nice. And Matt, you've got a letter to take to the abbot. Okay. Um, I'll head straight there while it's still light. Is anyone going with him, or are you all going your separate ways? Avender will hang back, just studying the map, quite interested in the cartography of it itself. Yep. I'll follow um, dragon for now. Are you, are you following him? You are you following him, or are you walking with him? I'll walk with him this time, <laughs> rather than just stealthily following. Yeah. Right. Um, so after about I don't know, fifteen minutes or so, walking through the the city, matter you, you you come to this big um, sort of ceremonial church. Um, it's in the district with quite a few other churches. Um, there seems to be it looks like a, sort of an afternoon mass is just finishing, so there's a load of commoners uh, just sort of sifting their way out, basically putting some copies into the collection plate as they go. Okay, I'm just gonna make my way through the crowd towards the church. Yep, you get into the church basically, and you um, you see there's like an old um, sort of man with grey hair who's just um, sort of emptying the collection plate into a into a small pouch. Um, I sort of would assume you're the abbot of this church. Ah, oh, yes. My name's Mikael. How how can I help you, son? I've been asked to deliver this letter and then hand it over. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, could you um, could you follow me, please, just in case I need to reply? And he he kind of leads you into a small room on the side. Um, he says, "I just need to get my spectacles." I've heard that before. And he um. 
he, he goes into like a, a fairly plain looking office, um, but there's a big oak chair there uh, and table. And he basically he fumbles around with a small pair of spectacles and then opens the the letter and reads it. He says, "Ah, oh, you're working with the the Baron." Uh, yeah, for the foreseeable future. It's a very generous man. He he helps us out quite a lot. Ah, yes. Um, he needs a cleric. Uh, oh, wait. I know just the person. Slightly lazy. Often found in the the library rather than rather than serving the people. Let me just pen a quick note to him. And he um he p- pens a quick note. Um, seals it with his sort of signet ring. And says the the person you'll be looking for is called Quail. He's um in the the library. It's a uh, two blocks over. He, he gives you a um a small piece of paper as well. That this this will allow you admittance into the the library to find him. Okay. Um. I guess I'll turn to uh, what, Brunhilde that's with yep. us. Um. I'm going to head to this library. I don't know if you can join us. Oh yes. I can definitely find a way in, if not. Uh, well, I have a letter of mission, so <laughs> yeah, I guess you could. But getting arrested now could prove problematic. It's catching you if it's the hard part. Yeah, okay. Ollie, you always haven't been that good so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you get to the... Um, So, uh, library. Yeah. the library, yeah, and there's a there's like a sort of this old guy that was got chased away with the kid earlier, um, and he's, he's he's sort of sitting there on the small stool, um, waiting by the door basically, and he sort of turns to you as you come in, and goes, uh, membership. Uh, I have this from the abbot, so I can come in. Oh, right, so he, he he basically looks at it and then he takes it off. You basically folds it up and puts it up, puts it in his pocket. And says. You're welcome to use the la- the library for up to two hours with this admission certificate. Okay, so I guess I'm getting that letter back. Is there any particular section you would look for that I could help you with? I'm looking for a particularly lazy cleric. Uh, oh, Quail. Yeah, that's the one. Yes, and he he points he points across to um, a table covered in in like books from the from the library. I I'm just gonna say I'm sat there. And I've got holding a book up, and I've sat there with my eyes open holding a book. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll go over to the table and just like <clears throat> see if I get any kind of um, acknowledgement from this quail person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to grab the book and sort of push it down so you can see me. The book just falls down and I'm just, my hands are still in the same position and my eyes are still open and I haven't moved. Okay. Um, I'm going to pull the chair out from under him. Oh, and I suddenly <laughs> jerk away because I'm on the floor. And I was, oh, what are you doing? I'm trying to have an afternoon nap. What are you doing? Leave me alone. Uh, you've been summoned by the abbot. Oh, okay. <laughs> he, he, he hands you he hands you a um, like a, a quick letter that's been described by the abbot, and uh, it's basically it's uh, like uh, instructions from the abbot that as part of your services to the to the holy order, you're to um, journey with the baron tomorrow morning um, with these individuals um, and fulfil the baron's requirements. So it looks like we're going on an adventure together, pub. Requirements, eh? It would seem so. The, there's a little note at the bottom that says, do remember to bring back the 10% tithe of anything the Baron gives you. For the church, of course. Well, obviously. Because, I mean, it's a donation to the to the church. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to head back to the pub. Or to the inn. Um, is where, going to join us? Where are we meeting in the morning? Uh... That will be at the what is it, Chris? How do you Callisto Warehouse. Callisto Warehouse. What time? First light. First Fishing. light. Yeah, first light. Bright and early. I shall be there. Okay. I 
guess I'll turn on my heels and leave then. I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> Does anyone want to do and collect any supplies or do anything? Yeah. Or tomorrow? Could I grab like six days worth of rations and like some torches and whatnot? Just general supplies. Uh, uh huh. Would the church provide me with rations or would I have to go and buy them? Um, you can probably get a couple of days' rations from the church. So, rations are five silver each. Remember, there's ten silver in the gold. Hang on a minute. Why isn't the Baron providing us with all this? Uh, he probably will be, but when bear in mind that this is Brunhilde making a, a yep. decision to go away and oh, buy okay. stuff. Fair enough. Certainly, they when they went to the baron saw a load of supplies being loaded, but obviously, you don't know that, so it's up to you whether you get any or not. Um, torches, torches. probably, yeah, probably just a silver each. Where does it tell you on your character sheet how much gold you have? Because I can't seem to find it. Very it bottom depends. middle, it'll be on, yeah, it's probably on your DD one. You might have to transfer it across because not everyone had worked it out. Uh... Well, it just says on my D and D one. It just says five ninety. So don't. Uh, do, do, do. Yeah, you've got five ninety gold. So on your uh, roll twenty one. It's the GP one, yeah. Yeah, so the one that says GP, just stick five five ninety in there. Okay. Right, anyone want anything else? Nope. I think Avid is just going to come back and enjoy having a decent wash after today's training and then, um, you know, have, have a pub meal and sort of rest adequately. Yep. So um, most of you guys pack up. You, you kind of settle up with the inn the, in keep of the night before so you can head out first thing in the morning. Um, you pack up your stuff and then you go, you go to sleep. Um, the, the, the people who are staying at the inn have arranged for the, the person like the, the sort of uh, the person in the inn who kind of wakes people up um, at certain times basically just to, to wake you up when the first light comes. Um, Quail, you get woken up about an hour before the first light by a narrate. Um, like the most junior of sort of clerics, uh, banging on your door basically, and as you as you come come through, it's sort of like he, he peeks his head around the door and goes, "The abbot just wanted to make sure you were up in time." Uh, I'm meditating, so I'm not very pleased that he's disrupted my meditations. And yes, I am up, and I'm already in my battle armor because I'm just meditating in it. <laughs> Because that's the kind of guy I am. And he, he, he hands you a, a small sack of um, like uh, like breakfast, effectively, that he'd um, prepared for you. Ah, thank you, boy. And he, he, then he leaves you to it. Flip him a copper. So, uh, before I leave the inn, can I buy a keg of ale? Uh, you can do. How much does that normally cost? I don't know. That's an interesting one. <laughs> Uh, five, I can tell you how much a gunpowder keg costs. <laughs> uh, I probably won't be drinking it. Um, I think probably it's probably up to you, depending on the quality. I think probably anything from say five gold to sort of fifteen gold or something like that, depending on what quality you want. So if you want something really rare and expensive, probably looking at about fifteen gold. If you want something which is okay. Five gold. Well, maybe a gold. A hundred, so fifteen it is. Yeah. So yeah, you get a keg of like ale or beer or whatever you you choose, yeah. cider or. Whatever. And then just carry it out of my shoulder. Yeah. So you guys rendezvous at the um, the warehouse, and you can see Thomas is um, busy arranging for the the final loading of the the caravans here. Um, there is five wagons, two are filled with stone, two are filled with wood, one's covered with supplies. There's four guards, eight workers or cart handlers, one servant, 
Um, there's also um, someone you introduced to is the innkeeper, um, and he's got like a young boy with him who's maybe about 16, 17. So he's he's been given like the the deed to the inn to run the run and operate the inn in the new village, and he'll be traveling with you guys as well. He's got his own little cart that's covered with like filled up with beer barrels and stuff. Um, and obviously the duke, the so the baron has his um, fancy little warded coach that he'll be traveling in. There's no horses for you guys. You just have to sit on the uh, the spread yourselves out amongst the various carts. Whoa. whoa, whoa. I'm going to cast someone's steed. <laughs> you can't do? I ain't walking. So is that a paladin ability at your level? Uh, fine steed. So I, essentially, I just summon an animal. <laughs> <laughs> I will settle for a horse. This one, over here. <laughs> That's mine. Not anymore. An unusually intelligent, strong, and loyal steed. I'll choose a uh, war horse, so it looks more the part. Yep. Yeah. Please uh, tell me you have to roll for it, and then you roll like a two. <laughs> and a donkey. Oh, it's a donkey! <laughs> <laughs> so, after about an hour or so, the, the, the caravan starts heading out. Um, the Going going through the um, the city, they have to stop several times to as there's like a bustle of morning trade going on. Um, but then eventually, the, you see the city gates, and and you're sort of waved out the city gates by the city guards. Um, and as you head out into the countryside, um, you start the sort of long journey um, to Estfield. Um, the first thing you notice, probably about two three hours in, you notice the smell of burning in the air. And as you, you kind of look around, you can see that in the fields on the side of the road, um, there's a load of like farmers and, and workers who are basically building a bonfire that they seem to be throwing various corpses onto. Um, now, you've, you've seen this before, um, and this is basically what they, what's obviously happened is that um, the undead have kind of moved a lot at night because they're more active, and then they've just kind of went zom sort of like... Um, um, the best way to start. they've kind of went limp effectively in the in the day and just kind of standing around so obviously the farm workers have went around and culled them so are they and like then, are the zombies like uh um day of the dead zombies but like modern day of the dead zombies and then not the original day of the dead so as in like they they can run around at night but then when it's the day they just shuffle yes them. yeah so they, they just shuffle and they, they, they'll go towards someone or like an animal or anything like that in the day, but generally they just kind of stay static. And then at night they become a lot more active. So the village, the, the, the farmers have obviously went around and just ha uh, hacked up these zombies in the, in the day and they're, they've got building a big bonfire just to throw the, the corpses onto. And then they seem to be getting on with their, the business of, of, of working in the fields. Can I... Um... Can I check to sort of see if there's many of the the slow ones still around in the local area? Um, you reckon from the bonfire, so that's like one field maybe. Okay. Uh, or maybe two fields, and the bonfire's probably got you probably reckon about eight or nine corpses on it. Okay. So I'm more sort of thinking about the the path in which we're heading, whether this might cause us problems in sort of, you know, as far as I can see. Yeah, at the moment they don't seem to have strayed out onto the road. Okay. But I think we'll assume that during the day, probably um, Matt's character will just will, will sort of ride ahead sometimes and end up smashing, you know, a zombie out of the way um, once or twice. But maybe once or twice a day, you, you encounter one which is on the road that you decide to. Um, and to be honest, I'd say we won't roll combat for that because it's not worth it for your level of characters against single ones. If any sort of mass of them appears, then obviously we might, you know, we might roll combat for that. But at the moment, you've only encountered like ones and twos. Um, sure. So at the end of the first day, um, the coaches all probably a little bit before darkness sets. Actually, probably a good good hour before darkness sets. Um, the coaches all, uh, or the coaches and carts all pull into a roadside inn called the Dancing Wolf. 
Um, so it's quite a large inn. Um, it seems to take a lot of um, tra uh, travellers at the moment. The, you can see there's, um, from the stables area, you can see there's just three other horses in at the moment. So there's probably at least three travellers in there. Doesn't seem to be any stagecoaches. There's possibly not any stagecoaches in tonight. Um, but basically the, the inn's surrounded by a large warded wall with two big heavy oak gates. And the, the courtyard area is big enough to take the, the all the carts and the, um, the coaching. Um, the the Baron basically sort of dismounts out of his um, little carriage and sort of mentions, I'll, I'll sort out rooms for everyone. Um, we'll see what they've got available. And um, EE e. wanders inside. You can see that the workers, there, they, they just set up a tent in the courtyard because they know that they're not going to get a room. Um, the innkeeper does sort of goes inside. The, the, the innkeeper, the new innkeeper basically goes inside because he's obviously going to try and get a room for himself and maybe learn a bit more about what how the trade's going on. But the, the Baron goes inside basically and comes out again and says, yeah, I, I've managed to get um, three rooms, one for myself uh, and two for you two, you guys to share. He, he he basically puts two two keys down on the table, and he says all, all the food's paid for, but you pay for your own alcohol. And please, obviously, drink in moderation. I need you awake bright and early tomorrow. The next next leg of the journey is a slightly longer leg. Avender looks elated at this, at the at the idea of having almost free boarding. Moderation sounds like a very strange idea. <laughs> I'm gonna order like. Four meals, because I'm going to load up on food so we're getting it paid for. <laughs> Can I yeah, ask so, if I'm able to perform? Um, you, you can do. So you go, you go to the innkeeper and he sort of, he sort of like goes, well, let's, let's hear a verse first. I'm going to need a drink. <laughs> Why? Is he really that bad? Oh, I'm the best. Just so good. Have an ale. <laughs> I'm going to bless the ale before I drink it. <laughs> Avidus sort of looks over. I'm sure you'll do fine, but you can see he's already starting to wince. So so roll, roll performance to judge whether the inn will let you play or not. Inky will let you play or not. Oh, mate. <laughs> oh. Average at best. <laughs> yeah, he's like... Uh, well, if any of the patrons complain, I'll ask you to stop. But I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll, give, you, I'll give you one go. Um, up you go. Any points at the stage, and then he um he, he takes out drinks for the the rest of you. Right, roll your performance now for your actual performance. Okay. Oh, oh yeah, buddy. Apparently, the yeah. really helps. He's uh, he's been holding back on us. Yeah. <laughs> the the, the innkeeper sort of turns to you and goes, he, "He's not that. Well, she's not that bad, actually. <laughs> not that bad." <laughs> I've heard better, but I've heard a lot worse. What's so what that... brings you folks to to the Dancing Wolf? Uh, we're an escort for the Baron over there. Oh, is that why we're here? <laughs> yeah. We're not getting paid get... for it, though. Huh. Well, that doesn't, I, sound, I very... Just, that doesn't sound very... Assuming... That doesn't sound very fair. Be making a donation to the church. So, how far are you heading? Uh, I'll give him a general description of the area that we're going to. Have you heard of it? It's not really. I know. I know Carrick, which it sounds like you're going through there. That's quite a nice little town. Nice wall. Um, good people there. Um, they have to put up with a lot being on the border, but apparently trade's quite brisk up there. Not heard of anything north of there, though. Most of the most of the outlying lands are in ruins still. Well, it is being rebuilt currently. Oh, well, good luck to him. So in the inn, there is three others other than the, the, the innkeeper and, his, and the serving girls, etc. Um, there's one old man. Um, he's kind of wearing robes. You suspect he's either like a, a, a wizard sorcerer or something like that. And he's kind of sitting in the, in the back um, and he's basically reading a book uh, while, he, while he finishes his meal. Um, there's also a um, couple of dwarves sitting at a table. Um, can't really tell. They look like they look like they're fighters of some description. One's got a bow. Um, 
one's one's got basically a, a sword and wearing chainmail, etc., and a little sort of helmet that is taken off and they put on the table. Um, and they they seem to have worked their way through quite a lot of alcohol so far. There's a lot of empty uh, mugs on the table with them, um, and they've, there's like four empty plates. That so obviously they've had two plates of, of food as well. Um, and eventually you see one of the serving girls goes around and um, cleans the plates away. And just as she's cleaning the plates away, the dwarf grabs one of the sort of bones off the off the plate, basically, and just licks it clean before he puts it onto the plate. Okay. I'm going to ask the dwarf in Dwarfish if there's been much undead activity in the area. He sort of he sort of looks up at you and he's and in, in Dwarfish he says, "Ah, you speak our language." I do. Come join us. Buy me a drink, and I'll tell you. I'll wave at the barman and bring my drink over. Yeah, and you you, you kind of sit down with them basically and they introduce themselves as uh, Gragga, who's the uh, male guy, and Bally, who's the female. Uh, there's always undead activity on the road. This is this is the wilderness. What sort are you looking for? Just generally if there's been anything unusual or... Uh... To be honest, it's been a shame. It's been a bit of a quiet ride. Um, not really had that much head to smash in. Have you uh, heard any reports of anywhere of anything around Carrig or has it been quite quiet around there? Oh, we came through Carrig. Uh, yeah, it's been quiet. It's, you know, smashed the heads of a couple of dwarves on the road. Um, Got a bit bored, went out to one of the fields and helped some farmers out. But other than that, it's been um, fairly quiet. Have you been to the north of Carrig? Or have you not no, no, we came, no, we came up from the south of Carrig. But I don't imagine it's much different. Most The, the last five, ten years, it's just not been the same. There's just not been, a, not been a lot of them around. Maybe we're finally getting a hold of the numbers. They can't last forever, can they? Hopefully not. So, how'd you come to know our language? Uh, just picked up a few bits here and there. Yeah, you, d you don't really have an accent. No, I was just dwarfs coming in the in the church. Just pick up bits in there over the years. Well, the other's doing well. Um, Quail is talking with the dwarfs. So whilst whilst they're talking, you can sort of see Avender as I'm sort of aimlessly following around a servant girl, not quite understanding that they come to you. Um, and when I finally yeah. manage to get hold of one, uh, please could you fill up my water skin? I've uh, it's been a long day. And she, she just says, "Oh, of course." Um, there's a, there is a well outside, but um, no, let, of course, let me... Um, and she, she basically takes the water skin into the kitchen uh, and she comes back with it with full. She's like, can I get you something to eat? Maybe something to drink? Uh, more water, please, and uh, a big meal. It's been a, a long, long walk. And she's like, oh, we, we just, we, um, we've got a hog on the roast, if, the, if that would deal, suffice. Hog would be lovely. And she she goes away to the, like the the kitchen and she comes back with like a metal plate covered in sort of thick slabs of meat um, and potatoes, cool. and she she puts it down at a table for, for you. And he over generously tips with sort of two gold pieces. And she's just like she just sort of like looks at you goes that that's far too much, sir. It's, it's fine. Clearly he's he's um, it kind of looks as though he's not quite familiar with having this much money, um, and he's quite excited by the fact that he can do this. Yeah, that's fine. She kind of she goes away and, and she starts giggling with one of the other um, serving girls. So for the rest of the night, pretty much you get very a lot of activity. Of would you like your drink refilled? Would you like seconds? Would you like a dessert? And there's like a constant barrage of extra sort of things coming up towards you. Okay, I think by the end of the night, I've probably been swindled a little bit. <laughs> Can I ask uh, the dwarves if they're looking for work? Um, they're like, oh no, not at the moment. Um, we're heading through to the to the west, to the um, east coast. Well, sorry, the, to the to the west, so we can go to the Eastern Kingdom. Okay. But yeah. 
I'll just get a seat close to the fire and then have some food and then maybe drift off and have a nap. Yeah, the fire, the fire in the actual main room is not um, burning tonight because it's not summer, so it's quite hot. I guess I'll just nap next to where there would be a fire then. Yeah. <laughs> Cast illusion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when you finish playing Brun Brunhilde, the um, the innkeeper comes over with a with a, a quite an expensive looking drink for you, um, and basically um, uh, and like a free meal on the house, basically. Although it's paid for by the the baron, effectively, he, he'll does he pretend it is a free meal because it's an innkeeper, they do that sort of thing. Uh, what he what he does do is he basically says. Uh, We've we've got a small extra room that we keep for guests, um, rather than you having to kit with your friends. Uh, and he gives you like a, a small key. It's a small room, but it gives you some privacy. I'll take it. I'm quite proud of it. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone want to do anything else before we call it a night? I'm going to walk around with my arms box, shaking it. <laughs> I'm going to do, but I'm going to do it after Brunhilde's done her performance so it makes it look like i'm doing a collection for brunhilde but i'm actually not i'm doing a collection for the church so the, the, only, don't know that. The, the only i mean obviously the, the innkeeper doesn't really sort of put anything in because he's charging you for room and board anyway um the the waitress has put like a few coppers in each um the the the, the you see the, the wizard guy uh he, he puts a gold coin in without realizing he's kind of totally engrossed in this book and i'm like oh thank you thank you yeah. I don't know if any of the players participate. Uh, I'll open up the visor on my helm as you go past, and then just close it and go back to sleep. Uh, yeah, Av Avinda does put uh, another gold piece in. I'm too busy eating to notice what's going on. <laughs> Quite happy stuffing my face. <laughs> so next morning, um, you guys get head out on the uh, the road again. Same sort of situation as before. Uh, all the carts in a little line. Um, the Baron mentions to you this time around, he says, the, the, the journey between um, the next inn is too long for us to do in one day, so we will have to camp out. Um, my guys have, have taken this road before, so they'll, they'll pick out a good spot, depending on how far we've made it, but yeah, we may need to be a little bit more cautious tonight. I've got a safe means of camping for those who are not in your caravan, I presume. So, Do we have wards? Pot I've wards. got a yeah. You, 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 the, yeah, there is, there is wards for the camp, but um, for you guys, uh, you can stay in uh, all these tiny little hut. Is it warded? It counts as warded, yes. Right. It, it comes, it can comfortably hold. Well, it can hold nine. It doesn't necessarily comfortably hold nine. <laughs> oh, it's cramped, but it's only, it's only, it's only. It's only can it hold so it nine halflings or nine regular people? <laughs> well, I think it's nine regular people, but when you look at the dimensions of it, it's not that big. <laughs> so it's nine halflings. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a magical uh, spell. It's a spell basically that can summon up a sort of sacred place. Oh, a lot, a lot. Awesome. Um, that you guys, no one can enter, but you guys can see out of because it can be made transparent. Um, so yeah, you can probably take watches from in there. Although you're probably actually better sort of out patrolling if you do take watches rather than sitting in the hut. Um, are we going to be required to take watches? Oh, probably, that's just... what you've been paid for. Hmm. Oh, well, I haven't been paid anything. So... <laughs> <laughs> you've been hired for. <laughs> so you, um, you head out, and it's a fairly uneventful day unless anyone wishes to do anything on the journey so does anyone want to talk to anyone or uh, discuss anything so is it just sorry, sorry. No, you be first alex please i was i want to actually ask the baron what it is i'm doing because i'm I haven't really been told anything about. Yeah, so for the, for the morning part, you, you you journey with the Baron and is is kind of inside his car, his carriage while he he discusses with you. Um, and he basically just explains what I explained to the rest of them mm -hmm. that he's the um, you, you're traveling up to a village that he's hoping to reclaim um, and thus increase the food supply that heads to the city. Uh, the village he says has a small church um, that seems to have survived. Um, now, because they, they found undead in the ground, they, they're assuming it's not consecrated anymore. So he'd like you to, to, you know, at some stage, once they're happy that the village is, is safe, to consecrate the church. Will the church be dedicated to my yes. deity? Right, okay. Yes. 
Yeah, the Baron already has um, like contact. Well, effectively knows the Abbot anyway, so he's already going to do that. Right. This is good. So yeah, you spend the morning in his carriage, and then he kind of excuses you out for the afternoon, so you can spend some time resting. Right. Okay. Um. So at the end of the day, you kind of you. you so Matt, I guess your character's at the head on your horse. Yeah. Sure. Can you make a perception roll, please? Good enough, I suppose. Um, so the the light's starting to fade a little bit, and off in the distance you can see there's a campfire lit side, at the side of the road in the like, clearing. Okay. Um, I'll motion to the... I'm assuming there's a guard or two near me. Um, yeah, there's a, well, there's a couple of guards on the lead wagon that's just that's short, just behind you. So I'll, I'll motion to it and then start to ride ahead. Yeah, so they, 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 they don't stop, but they slow down a little. They sort of order for the carts to slow down a little bit. Um, and as you ride ahead, you see there's like a, a there's a, a horse um, tied to a like a, a branch in, in this clearing. There's a, a fire, and then there's a guy with his back towards the the sort of wood watching the road. Um, he's not looking at the fire, um, and he's he's basically wearing the the sort of cloak and symbols of a messenger. Okay. Um, and he's he's basically sitting there finishing off uh, like a meal of rabbit or something like that at the moment. And you can see that he's set up a um, like a warded circle around him, like quite a small one. It covers him and the horse. Mm -hmm. You can see he's got like a bedroll sitting next to the um, the fire, and he sort of looks up to you. Just ride over, I guess. Uh, greetings. Hello. And what brings you to my camp at this time of night? Uh, we're just riding through the area. Probably going to break camp, break for camp ourselves soon. My name is mm. Dargan. I'm traveling with the Baron. Ah, Brodick. Yeah. Feel free to join me. This is probably your best camping spot nearby. You can always do some company. Okay. Um, Safety assuming... in numbers and all. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm assuming you'd be fine to join our camp. I'm assuming everyone else starts to catch up at this point. Yeah. So he suddenly looks down the road. He goes, "Quite a lot of you. Where are you heading?" Um, it'll be a new settlement to the north. Hmm. So Is it quite common to see messages and stuff on the road. Um, you've seen them before, yeah. I mean, generally they they um, there's probably one leaves major cities about once a week. Mm -hmm. So. You, you've run into them before, and obviously they have to camp just as much as anyone else does. Yeah. Have you got any messages of note for the general populace, or are there particular people? Most most of the messages I'm carrying tonight are for specific people. Okay. Well, we'll ask him about them then. Yeah. He says. He says. Although, to be honest, it's hardly worth making the run. I've only got. I've only. I've only I'm only carrying three letters, but the guild binds me to make the run, whether whether I have a hundred or three. What direction are you travelling in? Oh, I'm heading towards the city in the the west. Okay. Opposite way towards then, so I can't drop them off for you. Uh, I couldn't allow you to anyway, the, the guild rules. So, as you guys sort of make camp, um, the Baron sort of piques his interest when there's a, he realises there's a messenger here. So he comes out to, to speak to the messenger, and you, you can hear him asking basically if there's any messages for him. He introduces himself as, as a Baron. Um, and shows the messenger a signet ring. Basically, says, "Is there any messages for me? I'm ex expecting a message from one of my my people, Agar. Perhaps you have something in your pouch." And um, the the messenger explains he doesn't have anything for the Baron, and um, he's only carrying a few messages tonight. Um, and then you guys basically set up camp um, with the with the messenger, effectively. With the watch order, is it shared between us four and the guards? As well. The guards, no, the guards go with you guys. So there'll be you plus one, one guard right, on watch. Okay. So um, there'll be four watchers effectively, each of you guys plus one guard. Okay. Um, what race is everybody? 
I'm an elf. Human. Halfling. Okay. Um, just because I'm not particularly good at seeing in the dark, but I know some races are, so maybe they oh. want to take a later watch. Uh, I am, so whichever is the darkest I will period I'll do. I have dark vision, so. Yep. So maybe I'll so, take first watch? So Matty's going to take first watch. Who's taking second watch? I'll take second. I'll take Alex takes third because yeah. that's the darkest, and then Greg, you can take the sort of watch leading into morning. Do you mean me? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, does anyone want to cast anything, or um, are you going to use your tiny hut? Yes, I am. Do I have to uh, go to spell list? Will it pop up? Uh, probably. Like that, yep. Yeah. Yeah, 10 foot radius. So, who's sleeping in Ollie's tiny hut? <laughs> I'm uh, quite happy to sleep on the road with a um, just a roll out pack. Can I fit my horse in there? No. Then I guess I'm staying out on the horse then. Um, I'll just sleep in the hut. So you just you and Ollie sleeping in the hut. Cozy. Yeah. Um, on one of my spells on the roll twenty thing, uh, yeah. it's one of the cantrips, and it says it does one d eight damage, but then it's supposed to be two. So if I just change that to two, is it would it just do two d eight damage? Uh, is it? Does it do it? Does it do two at a higher level? Yeah, it says from level five it does two d eight. Like on the um, D and D Beyond, it says two d like Sacred Flame. It says two d eight, and then on the like character sheet on roll twenty, it just for the spell it just says one d eight. Yeah, so if you just alter that to two. Ah, right. we'll do two now. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, cool. Right. Some of the spells you'll find when you click on them, it asks you what level you want to cast it at. So some of them, where it's like cure wounds, you can probably cast at a higher level, and you just cross off the slot of the higher level. So you make the choice at the time, and then it will factor it in. Okay. Right, um, so first watch is May. You doing anything in your particular in your watch? Patrolling? You sitting? Um... Um, well, considering the only one up for watch, I'll patrol around the camp. Yeah, there's there's a guard up with you as well, so he kind of he kind of keep, he basically keeps an eye on the opposite. Uh, yeah, one side, and you you one the other, one to the other side. Um, so yeah, generally after you've sort of like served your time, you basically wake up um, Ollie's character for next watch. And Hilda. Cool. So, so, and then remember, yeah. I'm supposed to wake up uh, Avinda. Mm. I, was, I thought so. Avinda, you second. Yeah. Oh, so I thought you were first. Okay. First. So, so, so <laughs> well, you were second. So is Ollie the watch before? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Avinda, you you kind of get shaken, up, shaken awake by um, Dragon. Yeah. And so it comes comes to Zoha. Huh? Yeah. What? It's your watch, brother. Oh, okay. And sort of quite blearily sort of gets up and makes sort of um, has a drink of the water flask and then uh, starts walking kind of I'll aimlessly. I'll from my keg. Yeah. So w one of the um, the guard that got up with you is basically sitting there and he seems to be boiling something on the, um, the fire and he sort of turns to you, would you like coffee? It's really nice stuff. Coffee. <laughs> um, Alex is getting jealous of what you <laughs> And almost uh, quite tentatively, uh, I suppose. And he, he, he kind of basically, he, he, um, 
he pours off a sort of cup of coffee into this sort of like metal mug, <laughs> and he, he basically says, "Is this your first time trying coffee?" Is it not coffee? Maybe <laughs> <laughs> they have coffee and tea. I tend not to stray from the basics, if possible. Ah. Uh, I'll, I'll put a lump of sugar in it for you then. And he basically takes out a small pouch and he puts a spoon of sugar into it as well. It'll take the edge off the coffee for the first time. And uh, it's quite a considerable amount of time before Avinda takes his first sip. He's kind of just hugging the hot mug um, and almost as, as he drinks it, sort of, ah, this, this is good. This is really good. <laughs> get addicted to coffee yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Real medicine yeah. um, and it's not long before uh, I start my aimless wandering on patrol becomes quite a, a, a marched pace not 100% yeah. aware of the noise that I'm making do you yeah. stop for a and poop I... <laughs> not on my watch <laughs> Uh, I think you probably find that your character has a, the rest of the night when, when you're about to sleep you have a kind of restful night with the caffeine sort of hitting you for the first time okay um, next watch is Alex so it's getting quite dark now There's the, the moon's kind of hidden behind some clouds uh, and you're on, you're on duty with one of the guards can I get some of that coffee? <laughs> So you, you kind of yeah the, the 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 guard that's just going to sleep says yeah help yourself. I'm gonna get a big old mug of cup of joe. Yeah, so you, you go over basically you take the the kettle off the the fire basically <laughs> and you, you you pour it into one of the metal cups and there's literally like uh, like a, a a finger of a cup in there. There's hardly anything of it left. It's like the dregs almost of this coffee. What kind of uh, look 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 at Avinda as he's walking away and just kind of. Squid him and kind of <laughs> mutter curses under my breath, <laughs> and quite quite pleasantly and cheerfully, he's walking as he's going back. <laughs> yeah, and I kind of wave and go. So, Ollie, you have the the last watch, uh, and again, it's it's fairly uneventful watch. So, um, you you hear, I mean, you occasionally you hear the odd sound in the distance, but quite far away. Um, and you keep an eye out for a little bit of time in those in those areas, but then eventually the 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 night the the day uh, dawn arrives basically, and everyone's still fine. And you the, the everyone starts to wake up, and the the workers start to sort of um, you know relieve themselves, get some breakfast, and then start getting the the carts all ready to move, um, get the horses retacked up, um, and they and then everyone heads out again. So again, it's a fairly uneventful day, um, and at the end of the third day, you arrive at a, a large roadside inn called the Old Hunter. Um, and the, the the Baron sort of mentions, "Ah, this was, this is a good inn. I've stayed here before." Um, and he um, the the he gestures for you guys to go in. Now I've actually got a picture of this inn. Um, do, do, do. So if you want to scroll, scroll in and out, there's a little scrolly bar on the top right-hand corner. Yeah. That lets you zoom in and out. So all of the, the carts, etc., sort of cram into the... It's actually larger than it looks, the courtyard area. Um, and, and the innkeeper comes out of the actual... Um, the inn when he sees the people coming in, basically. And he, he walks over to the Baron's um, carriage, and you see the, the Baron sort of gets out, and he's, he's like, ah, Tobias, good. You still own the place then, um, and they, they shake hands basically, and they they talk for a little bit basically, and then um, they get just a gesture to everyone everyone inside, um, and the the innkeeper's wife, uh, a woman called Gertrude, she starts she she's, she's already starting to pour out um, tankards of um, beer on the on the bar, and she's like, come in, come in, you must be tired from the road. Yes, okay. Okay. Following. Amanda's at this point is almost sort of like zombie walking after everyone after such a poor night's sleep. And a cup of coffee for my for the monk. Yeah, coffee. And the the, in, the, in, the innkeeper's like, oh, I'm afraid we don't have any coffee. Uh, just um, hard liquor here. 
That'll do. Hard to look at effect, right? <laughs> So there's a there's a couple of other patrons um, sitting at the uh, one of the tables. Um, basically, it looks like a human female of some description. She looks more like a sort of professional, maybe like a craftswoman or something similar. Um, and there's a there's a, a guy sitting at the table with her. He's wearing quite good clothes. Uh, he's got a sword, his belt, affected, uh, and they, they seem to be having a, a quiet meal. Um, you guys get brought inside, basically, in the the. Um, the Baron comes over to your table, basically, and, and sort of says, uh, there's a small common room um, outside in, in the, the accommodation block. I've arranged for, for that for you guys. Um, I'll be staying next door in, in one of the uh, the, the bedrooms. Um, uh, and he sort of gives you a key to the to the common room outside. Before he's even finished, I've kind of wandered off to any free table in the corner and sort of sat down, legs on the table, sort of starting to nod cool so you probably go to this one sort of here uh, actually why don't I drag your tokens over so you're here effectively What the others are you doing? Um, I'll go to the bar and buy a drink and then offer to buy my colleagues one as well. Cool. Would you like a drink? And then offer to these two and see if we can get a table. Um, yeah, of course. Um, can I find the barman though and try and see if I can perform here? Uh, you can do. And the, the, the barman, sort of, Tobias, sort of turns to you and goes, ah, I'm sure the Baron's only brought the best bards with him. Feel free, lad. Or oh, last. <laughs> last, rather, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I might be a halfling, but... <laughs> Have you got long hair? I mean, yes. you look like a woman. Yes, I do. Right. <laughs> Very womanly. <laughs> so you, you probably stand in front of the fire, um, because that's kind of like the raised area. Yeah. Uh, I thought it wasn't the time of year for that. <laughs> it's great. It's, it is lit here a little bit, but um, it's not like a full-on fire. Uh, so, make your performance roll, Ollie. Okay. Now you've been built up. Oh no! Oh, yeah. Mate, mate, fucking smashed it. Smashing it now. Please tell me you like get up on the table and start like playing your loot behind your head like. Do my pants. So, <laughs> yeah, set on fire, like you know, you know, it's the other two, um, the other two, uh, what do you call them? Um, the other two patrons of the bar. They they start listening to you, Ollie, and, and actually, you know, listening along because of the quality of it. And then at the end, you sort of set. They they politely applaud. Um, Can I walk around with my uh, arms box again? <laughs> You can do, yeah. Make a. I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna shake it as well, okay. really loudly after after, he's fin after she's finished playing, obviously. So make a persuasion roll. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing it really loud now, really, 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 <laughs> like shaking it. Yeah. So you get some coppers, but not very much. <laughs> and I'm like shaking it under people's noses because they're. You know, no. There's only two patrons other than you guys, and uh, so you, yeah, you so I'm really, really shaking it. <laughs> <laughs> really shaking it. <laughs> so I'll just point out, Ollie. Remember, you could steal his arms box off, box off him. I'll let him build it up first, <laughs> um, just to get rid of it from him. Um, so you have a good meal, basically, and then the the Baron sort of mentions to you. He says. Um, to give you guys a good night's rest, um, I'll put the guards on, on the gates. It's fairly safe in; it's well warded. They'll shut the gates at night, so, uh, but I'll leave the guards in the in the courtyard uh, on patrol if you guys want to to have a rest tonight. Um, we've got another night on the um, out on the road tomorrow night, so it'd be good for you to get some proper rest tonight. Very generous of you. Yeah. And then he retires to his little room 
um, next to in, in the common area, well, outside of the common area. So he's basically in one of these little single beds, and you guys are in the room that's got six beds in it. I suggest we keep on drinking. Sounds like a fantastic idea. I sleep through all of this. <laughs> so who's drinking heavily or semi-heavily? Depends Me. how much Ollie's playing. Quite a lot. A lot. <laughs> so it goes jazz so, flute on it. Ollie, Matt, and Alex make con saves. Please. I'm not drinking heavily. Sorry. I'm, right, just I just have the one beer and then uh, I'm not going to yeah. So Ollie and Matt make a con save, please. Matt, you get the bonus, obviously, on yours. Ollie doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you guys are fine. Um, you might have a headache in the morning, but there's nothing that's actually going to affect you in any way. Right. Ollie, are you staying in your, in the common room or are you summoning Tiny Hut? Um, well, I presume this is Wardville, correct? Yes. So I don't see much point in using my Tiny Hut tonight. Nope. So. I'll stay in the column Just, there. Uh, put it up in the middle of the um, inn. By the fire still. Can I do a walk around of the perimeter of the um, the inn? Yep. It's, it seems to be in a set of... Um, it's, like, it's almost like it's part of a ruined village at some stage, and the, the inn's only left, the, the building left standing. So there's the, in, in this sort of foresty area, you can see lots of other sort of like leftover bits of village, but clearly that's sort of you know hundreds of years old. Can I go check the warden? Yeah. So as you go around, basically you, the, the wall seems to be in a really solid state, um, and a lot of the wards you can see have been freshly repainted. So most of the wards uh, are, are there for a longer time, seem to be quite good quality, and then you can see that there's been repairs made to other wards around the wall. Okay. Good. I'm gonna when I go back, I uh, comment on the well kept nature of the wards and uh, compliment. Yeah. Cool. Right. Do, do, do. Through the night, um, Avender wakes up. Just how hungry he is from not eating. Um, and mind sweeps any food that's been left <laughs> on the tables before, you know, with no shame, before finding another chair, falling back asleep in another chair. Nice. Classy. <laughs> so, so are you sleeping in the... Absolutely, yeah, in the inn, like in in the bar. Don't actually make it. So, um, around about, you get woken up, um, Greg, probably, probably about like five in the morning. So it's still dark outside, and you see that the the the, the innkeeper's wife's up, and she's starting to um prepare stuff in the kitchen so you can just like smell food and stuff like that being prepared and you kind of doze off a little bit back but you you kind of you can hear the the occasional clattering around as she's getting stuff ready for later on in the day okay um everyone else make a perception roll please with disadvantage because you're sleeping oh mate <laughs> <laughs> Nothing gets past quail. <laughs> yeah, so you actually all hear it. So basically, um, all of us, all of you, even Dagan with his seven. Mighty seven. <laughs> oh no, of course, yeah, it's disadvantage. No, actually, sorry, Dagan doesn't. Uh, I keep forgetting it's disadvantage. Right. Where... <laughs> That's some pretty loud, whatever it is. It wasn't being quiet. <laughs> So you hear a scream. I hear um, a scream. Yeah, everyone, including Greg, apart from Matt, he hears a scream. Can we tell where it's coming from? Out, uh, Not semi there. outside. So basically, you kind of hear a scream coming from this area here, where I've put the um, the innkeeper's wife marker. Okay. Who's the other guy? Is that the innkeeper? 
That's the innkeeper. He comes he comes running out effectively. So is that a low wall around the back of that then? Around uh yeah. It's a okay. it's a low yeah, it's a low wall. And basically as you uh, well actually what you, what you guys let's have initiative. So let me just set up this. Hold on a second. Just clear it. Uh, I don't think the token's assigned to me to click. Uh Let's turn all on. Should be. Uh, are we on token level? Yeah. Uh, I've got it. Never mind. I'm just being an idiot. I was on pan. Oh, uh, shit. Hold on. Put that. So, Matt, yeah, yours cancel when you get a chance to wake yeah. up, effectively. Um, so, who's missing? Who am I missing? Oh, me. Good deal. So, I just got to find it again. Oh, you got it at the top, yep. Uh, you need to do it properly, Ollie. Have I not done it properly? Click on your character. You need to click on your token. It's okay, I'll put you in. Oh, okay, sorry. There we go. Do I click on it and then obviously we'll run a roll? Yeah, it's okay. I'll put you in. Okay, uh... thank you. There you go. Dave, I didn't know I didn't know the DM could take part in the combat. Is that you? On the ball. <laughs> Can't believe you only roll a twelve, Dave. Hello. Jesus. Right. Um so, uh, what you guys want to do then? So first up, we have Greg, your character, Avendar. Okay. So I wake up, um, well, sort of been awake, um, and immediately bolt upright and start. Am I right in thinking that this is a door? Yes. Um, so. And you can hear the sound coming from that direction. From that direction. So I'm going to try and uh, vault the the bar to get to the towards the door. How do you do a ping thing? Uh, you hold down, you click. Ah, is so, that thing that I just clicked on? Is that is that a gate? Yeah, there's a gate, but the wall's quite low there actually. So it's only like waist height um, little wall. So okay. you could vault the wall as well if you wanted. Okay. So. Um, yep. Yeah, so you basically your normal movement. You're quite 45. fast, so you'll basically get to about here probably. Okay. Do I need Except to? In the door. Am I right? Just vaulting the the bar, or do you want me to roll for it? No, nah, you're okay. Are you yeah. a monk? I'm not going to make you roll to fault the bar. Okay. Um, what you notice is you see the innkeeper basically in his in like a nightgown sort of thing, and he, he's pointing down the cellar, and basically he says they, they've taken her, they they grabbed her. Um, I just Who? saw them just before. I, I don't know hands. Okay. And he... uh, do I bother spending a key point? Um... I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that for the, this term. Right. Um, next up, we have so dragon. Your character gets a chance to hear this again. So perception, normal roll. In... Actually, I'll give you advantage because they're all getting up around you. So seventeen. Yeah. So you basically you see them getting up and pulling weapons and stuff like that. On um, you didn't hear the actual scream though. What? What? What's going on? What are we doing? There's a scream outside. Uh, you don't seem particularly concerned. Can I go back to sleep? I don't know. It, it sounded like a woman's scream, so something's clearly happened. Okay, I'll start getting up and grabbing my shield and stuff. Yep, so that take, sort of uses up your actions yeah. when you're waking up. So, Quail. Uh, I'm going to go run to where the I heard the scream from. Yep, so you probably, by the time, you know, including getting through the doors, etc., probably managed to get to about here. And again, you see um, Avinder's character. I want to ask. Avinder, sorry, he's sort of standing there. I want to ask Avinder what's going on. What's going on, Avinder? What's going on? Mr. He's Monk. Asleep. I'm going to wake, shake the monk awake and go, Monk, what's going on? Why are you sleeping when someone's been, <laughs> someone's a scream? It's almost. Uh 
kind of trying to make sense of what's happened. So um, it doesn't really reply and just points with quarter staff down, um, down to the down the steps. Uh, I can I tell the barman to go and wake the other guards. You can do. Barman, um, go and the other guards. <laughs> yeah, but Nilda. Um. So I'll run outside to everyone else's to see what's going on. Obviously. Yeah. Um, so we will just take uh, everyone. Copy, and we'll switch to this. Can you see that? Nope. Yep. nope. It's black. Uh, scroll uh, down on the page. Scroll, oh, yeah, so you need to scroll down to the uh, page. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I can see. Right. So basically, it, it looks like the cell has been broken through to by some ghouls. The area where the barrels are here is is kind of been all broken through, and you, heard, you can hear a scream coming from the, down that direction. Um, I'll roll initiative for the goals. My turn order literally just says Ollie's entry. Is anyone else? Yeah, like that? yeah, yeah, it's mine like that. Mine's like that as well. Uh, shouldn't do. Well, it does. Same for me. It shows only me. Uh, maybe it's just the way it works. Um, I can see them all anyway. Uh, ghouls are going on 19. So they'll go after Matt's character. So um, we'll just assume that you you guys have all sort of dived down, basically, and, and this is the situation we're in. Um, Alex, your character has dark vision, so you should actually be able to see slightly more than everyone else. Yep. Um, everyone else, basically, vision is only coming from the torches which are on the walls at the moment. Awesome. So is it... I can see the torches and there's like a little circle around. Can everybody else just basically, and then there's like a darker bit. Everybody else can just see that and then I can see everything else, right? You can see, you, you can see up to 60 feet. So up to 60, so up to um, what, 12 squares. You should be able to see. Yep. Okay. But obviously, walls and stuff block line of sight as well. So, right, um, Avinda. Okay, so after coming down the steps, um, seeing the first uh, ghoul straight in front, I'm gonna sprint forward as fast as I can. Um, so yeah, you can definitely make it to the ghoul in this turn and still act. Yeah, and. I am going to take a swing, almost using my quarter staff as like a baseball bat, so two-handed. So you hit, and you do nine points of bludgeoning damage. And then for my second attack, because I get two, I will come back on a backswing. Yep, and your backswing again smashes the ghoul, and its body collapses. Awesome. And I won't spend any key. Uh, dragon. Uh, so I guess I run down um, in like my box of shorts and a shield and a mace because uh, I didn't get a chance to put my armor on. And... Yep. So just obviously adjust your AC accordingly. Uh, It'll be your Dex mod plus two for the shield. Yeah, remember change that back. 
Yeah, you don't need to change on the sheet. Just, just remember when you're telling me what the target is. All right. Uh, so I'll just sort of run in and try and sort of assess the room. Yeah. So obviously you've got um, your movement in whatever your movement is in feet it gives you so five feet squares. So I'm just going to start just to move into the room. Yeah, so you move into the room, and you can kind of see there's like a cluster of ghouls, and a, a slightly more menacing-looking ghoul behind them that you, with your knowledge of the paladin sort of cult, um, law, in fact, you, you suspect is uh, like what they call a ghast. Okay, um, then I'll try and hit that one with an Eldritch Blast. The ghast? Uh, that yeah. thing, yeah. Yeah, that, so that's this one here. And it does two attacks, so... First one's a hit. Uh, so, so, but yeah, both of them are hits, so... 19 points of damage. Uh, I don't have advantage, so it'd be 14. Oh yeah, sorry, 14. Ah, right. That's me. Cool. Right, the ghouls now move. So this ghoul here is going to move in here. This ghoul here is going to move in here. Mm -hmm. This ghoul here is going to move in here. This ghoul here is going to move to here. And the ghast is going to move to about here. Cool. So first ghoul on Greg. Mm -hmm. um, what's your AC, Greg? 15. Um, what's their attack? Don't do a bite or claw, claw I think. Can you not see what his AC is, Dave? Um, not easy. Not without me opening up his character sheet. Oh, okay. It's just easier for me to ask. Yeah. Um, he only got a nine though, so he misses. Okay. Um, the first one on uh, Matt. Can I use a reaction for it coming into my zone of control? No. So um, you can use a reaction against it attacking you, though. I think. Depending on which reaction it is, it'll tell you on the reaction itself. So, let's have a look. oh, ignore that. My reaction's crap for this. Right. Don't worry. Yeah. The, if it moves out of your zone of control, you can use a reaction to have an opportunity strike. Ah, sorry, that's what I was asking. Yeah. Right. Um, right, first one against Matt with claws. What's your AC, Matt? 11. Yeah, and I just got a 9 again, exactly the same as the previous roll. <laughs> Second attack. Oh, great. I, quit. I missed. We're a one. So uh, it's going well for the ghoul so far. Um, that's can't my... touch this old man in his boxer shorts. Yeah, that's that's my round over. Uh, Quail. Uh, I will shoot the one in front of me with. Uh... Do you want to click highlight the one that you shoot? Oh, the one that's direct, the one square away from you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will use Sacred Flame. Uh, does that just do 10 points of radiant damage straight? Uh, I think so, yeah. It just... yeah, two, two, yeah, 2d8 plus 8. So, yep, so you do 10 points of damage to that one. It is uh, injured, but still alive. Do you not have to roll like a spell attack for anything? Like those. If it's, I don't think Sacred Flame yeah, maybe is. It not. Maybe. Um, it just says the target gains no benefit from cover from this saving from this saving throw. <laughs> oh, a saving throw he's got to make against your. It says flame light radiance descends on a creature that you have seen within range. The target must succeed on a dexterity saving throw or take one d8 radiant damage. That's oh right, save. yeah. So he gets a dex saving flame basically. This says the target gains no benefit from cover from the saving throw. I don't know. Yeah, why. so basically I have to roll I have to roll the dex, dex to see if you take half damage, I think. Yeah. And I think they've got plus one dex. So yes, he doesn't take any damage. Okay. Yeah, it's not a, it's, it's not a half damage one, it's uh, Oh is it? Oh. I think I think it's you did that one wrong, Dave. I think uh, you rolled wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um what, do you want to do anything else, Quail? Um, Let's pull your action. No. 
Um, <laughs> Brunhilda. Yeah, so can I uh, move um, around basically to the, where the torch is in front of me? Yeah. So there. Yeah. And then can I cast Fireball behind the two um, facing Dragon? So the, cu- the ball should hit the two. Rule, but not him. Let me just have a look. Fireball. It depends if Fireball has to be targeted on a person or it can be targeted right, on okay. Um, so point, yeah, point you choose within range and blossoms in the low roar. Each creature in the 20 foot radius centered on the point must make a dexterity test. Target takes uh 8d6 or half on a failure, so 20 foot radius sphere. I'd really appreciate if you didn't hit me with that. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. trying to do here. <laughs> yep, yeah, so you can hit those two that are on that without hitting him. Yep, hopefully, there's nothing flammable in those barrels. Would the splash hit this guy? No, because it's 20 foot, so it's a force foot square, isn't it? It's a it? 20 foot radius. But yeah, radius is half, so. What? No, a 20 foot radius would be. It would be yeah, 40 foot in diameter. Yeah, um. Radius is half the diameter, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so it'd be so 40 feet. Effectively, in theory, you could actually, if you targeted it somewhere like here, you could hit all three, all four of these guys. Let's go for that then. Because effectively, you've got four squares out from the center point. Yep. Wouldn't that hit me? No, so it should hit the front of them. No, basically, he's, he's putting it far enough back that it's he's oh, the, the the that that column is as far as he's planning to hit. Oh, okay. Right. So, do you want to roll your damage? Yep. So, do I just click fireball, or do I just roll eight v six? Uh, you should be able to click fireball. Okay, so well. Uh... Uh, cool. It's cool that it reminds you how many slots you've got left. Yeah, you can yeah. configure it. I've got it's, I've got it configured for um, sure Alex's arrows as well. Counts as arrows as he fires them. Uh, it's a pretty crap ball you got there. Twenty. <laughs> so uh, let's see then. So I'm, I'll start with the top one. How come on his it says the DC dex? He does a dexterity save for him. And then I'm mining. Oh, it's, it's it's the target for the save. Um, it might be because Sacred Flame might not be a core spell. In which case, it should be there. Oh, or, yeah, I don't know. Did you create a custom thing for Sacred Flame, or did you take it out of your spell book? It's just one of the cantrips, which I picked. Um. Yeah, anyway, we'll worry about that later. So, yeah, so DC 15, the first one passes. So does take, that take half damage then, or? Take half damage. Second one passes, but only just. Third one fails. The third one's dead. Um, these two haven't been hit yet, have they? At the front. front of me, no. Yeah, so they're both fairly hefty, fairly heavy down on. Um, you can kind of see their their bodies have co- sort of caught fire a little bit, May. So they're they're pretty heavily injured, uh, and the ghast as well. Let's see what he does. And he has been hit already. So you know, on the saving for us, yep. um, on the D and D Beyond thing, when you look at the spells, it says like for second frame, it says like Dex fourteen. Do you have to beat that? Yes. And if you do beat that, then yeah, okay. okay. Fair enough. Yeah. It's based on your spell modifier normally. So some spells are a fixed amount. Some of them are based on your spell modifier. Okay. So that's why Ollie's is at um, DC 15 because of his spell modifier being quite high. Okay. Um, can I also, as my uh, bonus action, give Matty some bardic inspiration? Since I'm rather worried about the two ghouls yeah. facing him. So, what does that do at your level? At my level, uh, blah, 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 it can add. It's not saying I'm a sheet I've got in front of me. Oh, shit. Sorry, no. It's the one, the one here. Sorry. I mean, this is kind of just really a mini, mini combat to try and get you guys yeah. used to your characters at first. Uh, blah, 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 blah. 
doesn't actually say on here. I've got it in the, the books right here. So page fifty-three. Thank you very much. Either way, I'm feeling pretty inspired. Uh, <laughs> D8, uh, I think, at this level. Yeah, D8. Yep. So, Mai, you get a D8 to use when you choose. Is it to hit off a damage? Or... Um, basically, you can add it uh, to attack roll, saving throw. It can be added after seeing a roll, but before knowing out the outcome. Okay. Cool. Uh, you've you. got, you got to use it within the next 10 minutes, but that's, the combat's quite fairly quick. Um, right, so I think we're back up at um, Avenda. Cool. So I'm going to uh, attack the one in front of me um, one-handedly this time. Yep. Which I hit. Yep. And then I'll take a second attack against him as well if he isn't dead, which I you miss. miss big time. Uh, I'm going to spend a key point. And I will uh, cast Flurry of Blows, cast Flurry of Blows, uh, to uh, kick him for a other attack. Yep. Which I do. Which kills him. Boom. Um, then can I move up to uh, the side of my semi-naked friend? You may do. Bloop. That'd be my turn. I just want to check something. I think you might have an extra attack. What, even one more? Mm. Does Flurry of Blows grant you two extra attacks? Uh, I could take... Oh yeah, I could take two two unarmed strikes. Yeah. Um... But I don't know whether I'd be able to do that on a separate target. So I saw something about you attack using a It's creaky dog. <laughs> that dog creaks so loud it echoed through my mic. Well, there you go. Need to sort that out, man. Sorry, man. Uh, you know on the roll twenty spell. I'll I'll, I'll look it up for later. Yeah, okay, no worries. How do you cast a like level one spell at like level three on it? Does when it you cast... when you when you click on it, it'll ask you if 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 the spell's one from the player's handbook, it will ask you what level you want to cast it at. If it's one that I've had to write in for you manually, then you'll have to just manage it yourself. Okay. So like if you click on cure wounds as an example now, just to see it, it should come up and say what level do you want to cast it at. All right. I don't know why it doesn't say that for the. Uh... Because some of them are some of them you chose outside of the player's handbook spells, so those aren't integrated with all twenty. So I just had to create the blank entries. Okay. I can't. I can't write it to do the multi-level. Well, I can semi do it, but. Um... Would you have to create individual entries for each one then? Well, that's what I did do, but um, I'd have to edit. I'd have to work out how all the edit stuff works. Um... All right, yeah, so Unarmed Strike, if you look at on what um, D&D Beyond, if you look at Unarmed Strike, Greg, yeah. when you use the attack action with an Unarmed Strike or a Monk weapon on your turn, yeah. you can make one Unarmed Strike as a bonus action. Okay, so uh, you, as opposed to using twice, a key attack point. twice with your quarter staff, which yeah. counts as a Monk weapon, and then you get a free punch at the guy. Okay, and then if I spend key, I get two punches. Yeah, but you can't spend no, you can't spend key there because the key was spent as a bonus action, so it's either or. Because it uses up your bonus action to get the free punch. Yeah, but I could have punched twice because I get two unarmed strikes as a bonus rather than one if flurry of no, blows. That's right. So let, let's right. So flurry of blows is something different. Ah, right? okay. Right. So when you attack twice, yeah, using your normal or, or attack once even, right? You get the option for free called unarmed uh, strike of basically punching the person, provided you've attacked with a monk weapon, right? That doesn't cost you anything. Okay. Right? But it uses up your bonus action slot. 
Right? Okay. Now, similarly, instead of that, you could use your bonus action to do a flurry of blows, in which case you get two unarmed strike, yeah. but it costs you a key point. Yeah, cool. So one bonus action for three punch, or two for a key point. Okay. So if you take that key point back, because you only used one to kill him, we'll just assume, we'll just assume you've done that unarmed strike. Thank you. Right. Oh, end of my turn. Um, I say it'll take a while, people, because we're playing se um, seven other characters, it'll take people a while to get used to yeah. all of the different things that they can do. Can you mush um, that guy's head? Can you cross, uh, him, cross him for me? I oh, yeah, I was, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. is he Time. dead or not? He is. So, uh, Dragon. Um, I'm just going to take like a sweeping blow and try and put one attack into each of those ghouls. So, the first one. Yep. And the second one. Uh, first one hits, second one doesn't. Mm -hmm. So, first guy, first one dies. And then I'll just shift over so I'm directly in front of this guy. Yep, cool. Right, uh, the ghast is going to move over and stand over his friend. And the ghoul next to him. Uh, I think the ghast can attack you, Avender. Um, and he's going to use claws. Okay. Yeah, trying to beat What's 15. Your AC? 15. Cool. This guy is slightly better. Oh, he crits. Out. So 2d6 plus 3 plus an extra 2d6. Uh, 18 points of damage. Out. And you need to make a constitution DC 10 save. But you're you're standing next to Matty, so your constitution is... Additional plus 4. Additional plus 4. So if you click on the constitution save button... Uh, where are the saves? Top left, Top left of your sheet. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Calm. Yeah, so easily. Even before, even without the um, thing. The bonus. Um... So it yeah it does a fair amount of damage to you, and then the other one's going to attack. Um, uh, uh, misses. Um, I think that's me. So Quail. Uh, I am going to use guiding bolt, and I'm going to shoot the ghast. Uh, I'm going to cast it at level 3. Uh, yeah, so you hit. Uh, the ghast dies. Fucking nice. He's only taken a few hits from different people. It just leaves the one ghoul in the room. Um, by the way, make sure you guys are crossing off your spell usage because... This is the start of the next day, remember? So you're not yeah. going to get your spells back because you've already had your long rest to get your spells. I was going to say when you expended it, it did seem a bit odd since I'm supposed to have three level three. So don't worry, I'm it depends it. if you've it depends if you've set it up properly on your sheet. It will count down if you set it up properly. I don't know how are you supposed to set it up properly. On your spells list, you press the up arrow next to the slots thing. Right. Okay. So, well, the up arrow next to the slots. Right. So on your spell list. Yeah. Uh, you see at the top where it says slots total four, slots remaining zero. Yeah. At the start of each day, you move the slots remaining up to four. Press a little arrow next to it. Right, okay. All oh, right, okay. And then, then it will count those down as you cast them. So because I cast the Guiding Bolt at level three, and it should have been, it's a level one spell, but I did it at level three, I should just tick it off the you level, use a level three. three slot, yeah, rather than... Uh... Right, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Right, so if you, I'll leave you guys to set up your spell usage. Yeah, um, <laughs> So I think that was that was your go. So I think it's just um, Brunhilde. Um, can I shoot into combat, or is that a separate thing in this? You can do. I think you get disadvantage. Okay. In that case, can I just um, hit, walk up to next to him, and hit it with the, my sword? You can do. Which is bigger than I am. Are no, you a just... rogue by any chance, as well? No. No. Okay. Sadly. Um, so if I just go to, so 
So this is what you're saying with using the um, one with longsword uh, H H X W, isn't it? Are you using green flame? Uh, no, because I'd have to cast that, which would be another action, wouldn't it? So no, the green flame goes instead of your melee attack. Oh, because okay. otherwise you'd never be able to cast it. Basically, you cast right. the spell, but as part of the spell, you make a melee attack. Yeah, in that case, um, yeah, I will do. Uh, right, so you just have to remember to obviously use a upper use. Well, green flame is a can is it a cantrip. Can it's a cantrip. Yeah. So effectively, you would be using um, lo uh, long the L sword X F W G F one. Yeah, because you've not cursed him. So okay, so there we go. Uh, yep. So you hit and you do five points of damage plus two for the. So it's done seven points of damage to that one. So he's still up. Um, top of the round, Greg. Okay. Um, I'm going to three, five, ten, fifteen, twenty. I'm going to run all the way around because I can do that with that movement speed. Actually, although the ghast is dead, his body's still next to you. So, uh, there's, uh, any creature that starts his turn within five feet of the ghast must succeed on a DC ten Constitution saving throw or be poisoned. Damn. Okay. So make. I'm sure you'll make it because I mean, I say you've got plus four for May. Yeah. So you're yeah, fine. Easy. Okay. So I'm going to run past and I will uh, jab this one um, with my staff. Yeah. Uh, that's a nine. Uh, not enough to hit. Okay. I'll take a second attack. Yeah. Thirteen. That's a hit. Yeah. It's dead. Okay. Only had nine left. Fantastic. And then I'm just going to use my bonus action just to uh, football kick the dead ghast in the head. <laughs> it explodes and does poison damage to everyone. Just a great spot. Yeah. <laughs> Can um, I just ask a question? Sorry. Um, yeah. on, when I cast my spell, it obviously rolls for the range thing, and then it says four high level cast and then 16. What, why? What are the two different numbers? Which spell? The um, guiding bolt. So it says four, four radiant high level cast, and then it says sixteen radiant. So I'm assuming that sixteen is the actual damage, and then I don't know what, what's the four. Right. So um, a flash of light streaks towards a creature of your choice within range. Make a range spell attack on the target. So basically, you have to roll to hit. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, I get that. So the plus four to that roll to hit will be your spell casting modifier. Oh, so, so, the, so the four is the spell casting modifier. Uh, let's have a look. I, I just want to know what the four, why it says four and then 16. Uh... Right, so you've got plus six to attack, and then it's. Um, it does 46 radiant damage and then for each level you cast it above second level it increases damage by 1d6 so I don't know where the 16 is coming from because that would be what another 6 so you could do up to 10d6 damage if you cast it no, I understand what oh, the, no, yes. the 16 is because it's saying oh, when you you know when you hold it above it, it says like what each dice roll was. So it's five plus two plus five plus. Oh, four. so you're looking at you mean what the dice roll thing was. No, so you know it says sixteen radiant, and then the thing literally just above it on the um, chat thing, and it just says four radiant high level cast. I just want to know what that is. Why does it say that? Uh, one times two d six equals two plus two. So. I reckon that's the additional damage from casting at a higher level. So it does 4d6 basic, and then you've got an extra 2d6 in there, which you happen to roll the yeah, twos. I yes, that's so. what it is. Yeah. So your actual damage for that one should have been... Um, 20. 20, yes. Oh, right, okay. Right. So that extra damage is from the higher level cast, and the 16 is from your base 4d6. Okay, right then. Okay. I just wanted... I'm just asking because I've, I've okay. no idea. So. Cool. Right. What do you guys want to do? Uh, well, there was a scream that came from down here, so we need to find the source of that scream. So I'm going to run towards the darkness, I guess. Yeah. I light a torch and follow him. 
Can I say, do, do, where, do we know? Do you, you want to let a coach, Ollie? Do yeah. we know what direction it came from, the screen? It's somewhere over this way. Right. Yeah, so I will give Ollie a torch. I can't, I can see over there and there's nothing else there, so you're safe to go. So. Ollie, has that changed your light view? Yes, it, it has. And mine. I think it changes everybody's. Story. Yeah, everyone can see Ollie's. Yeah, but obviously, as Ollie move, as you guys move away from Ollie or yeah. vice versa, then it'll affect it. Uh, so feel free to move your tokens to where you want to move to. So I guess around here. Source of where the screams came from. So just remember, Ollie, you've got one hand full with a torch at the moment. Yep. So uh, make a perception roll, everyone. I would like to use luck. Three. <laughs> nice. Oh, <laughs> worthless <laughs> luck. Right, so Quail and Brun Brunhilde, you guys can hear another scream coming from this direction here. Are there any like cracks in the wall or anything that, like where the ghouls could have got in from? Uh, this, I mean, this, that, this bit here looks like a big crack in the wall, as does this bit here. We can't. Um... You need to move in, possibly, to see it, because bear in mind it also does line of sight. Right. So, what's this that I'm looking at here? Where it's like, it's a, it's a, like a, 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 like a, it looked like a sort of set of doors leading to a cellar, and it's right. all been smashed open by the ghouls. That oh, seems to be the room that came in. I thought there was a wall. Yeah, I thought that was a wall as well. I yeah. was trying to work it out what it was. I mean, the thing um, which, um, this, this bit here, yeah, this bit here is a um, broken in door. Ah, uh, okay. okay. Uh, I guess I'm going to run down there then. Yeah, I'll follow him in so you can see where he's going. Right, move yourselves. So there's a break in the wall here, and there's a break in the wall here. And this bit here is where you can hear the scream coming from. I guess we'll go to, I'll, I'll go towards the sound of the scream. I haven't just because hello? I follow you, follow Draven a few paces back. And then just ask Ollie to keep following behind us because I can't see you without him. Yeah. Right, if you stop there, so we'll do initiative okay. again here. So. Fresh initiative or what we were on? Uh, we'll use what we were on. Ah, okay. It didn't actually show on my thing what the initiative is, it just says go. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know why it doesn't show you. I, I get to see the whole track. I'm not sure why it doesn't show you. I'll, I'll work that out. Does so, Matt, basically. We'll go to a different section for us. Yeah, basically, a, load of ghoul, a couple of ghouls ambush you from the darkness, basically, as you come out into this open. Mm -hmm. So, they rush in and get an attack against you, and then it will switch the initiative order. Cool. Um, cool. Tracy at the moment again. 11. Can I see them? Yeah, uh, yo, you, you'll see them as they come around the corner, but they come out of the darkness literally right on top of them. Yeah, can, I can, can I see them? I can see them, can I? Like, I no, not... because there's, there's like a wall there, so literally, oh, as, okay. as Matt's character sort of steps forward, they just jump out from the darkness. What I'm yeah, saying but, is, if, was, if there is, there, uh, there is not any darkness for me. Because I can see no, them. Because, yeah, but no, but there's actually a, a wall. So right, I'm saying okay. that they jump out from around the wall. <laughs> Ollie, what are you saying? Is, can I use my um, cutting words reaction, though, on one of them? No, because you can only use reaction when you attack yourself. Ah, uh, right, okay. It's not a reaction to general stuff, it's a reaction to yourself. <laughs> Say some mean things about his mother. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it says here, but as a reaction, when a creature within, I can see within 60 foot makes an attack roll, ability check, or damage roll, you can expend one use of bardic inspiration. Um, to subtract the number from that creature's roll. Uh, yeah, I mean, you yeah. insult his mum. Say he's not very good at his uh, general zombie feet, uh, stuff. He's just not very good. You smell awful. No, that would be good for him. He wants to smell awful. I'd be like, you smell like, you smell lovely. And he'd be like, oh. Uh, so we're using cutting words. Yeah, cutting words, which is uses one of my uses of um, inspiration. So I should be down to two now. Uh, you're not inspiration, you mean bardic, uh, bardic inspiration? Bardic inspiration, so yeah.
Yep, cool. That's fine. So, which one? The first attack or the second? The, the first attack against Max character or the second attack against Max character? Um, I'll go with the second, say. And what does it drop it by? Um, so we need to roll a d8 for it, and it'll drop it by that. So roll, okay. roll the d8. Okay. Matt, what's your AC at the moment? Eleven. It rolled seventeen. So I'll leave it to the Ah, sorry. Uh, slash no slash roll. roll. Ah, slash roll. There you go. Oh. Yeah, it still oh, hits. Why? Thanks. <laughs> Your insults need some work. Yep. Uh, so. Does 2d4 plus 2. Five points of damage. Okay. And you need to make a DC 10 con save or be oh. paralyzed. Oh, no. Yeah, you're fine. So, top of the turn order then. Um, so, Avender. Okay, I'm going to jump over Brunhilde and make yeah, my way to the fall. side here. Now, before I start, can you do use a bonus action before your action, or does it have to be in a certain turn order? You can do or any is, point. You can, yeah, you can just be using points. Okay. So, but bear in mind, some of your bonus actions will, will act after an attack. So, like, for example, oh, the yeah. arm strike says after you've made an attack, you get a free punch. Oh, that's so lame. Okay. Um, <laughs> have I, how much movement I got? 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, you 35, got loads 40. Of movement. I'm going to come all the way around behind them. Yeah, as long as, as long as you stay inside their combat zone, you don't get an attack yeah. opportunity. Um, so I will hit this one directly be behind in front of me um, twice. Two 15s. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's dead. Okay. And then... This one here, I'd like to spend a key point for Flurry of Blows and then a second key point for... Actually, that's not even worth it. Might not be able to, because bear in mind, if you spend the key... If it, you only have one bonus action. Yeah, I was I was going to make it an open hand technique, but there's no right. point in headbutting him 15 feet across the table. Um, <laughs> so uh, nice. I will just spend one key point to uh, just do a Flurry of Blows. Uh, so I'm going to do two unarmed strikes on him. One doesn't hit, yeah, so one the does. The first one's not very good, second one does. So he's taking some damage. Um, Dragan. Yeah. I guess I'll just uh, try and backhand it across the face with my mace. Which I think I do successfully. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it just, so just came up on my screen. Uh, yeah, you hit, and that's enough to kill it, but it's only had um, a small amount left after Greg hit it. Uh, thanks, Savinda. I uh, did see those coming. And, uh, and you sort of hear really a excited. coming from this direction here, towards your northeast. So kind of up here. Right, okay. And up here. Okay. Um, so no one else wants to add to it. Yeah, I was just motion, just um, Brenda, stay f about five feet behind me. Yep. Okay. I'm gonna um, actually walk up alongside Dragon this time, just in case we get ambushed again. Cool. Right. So what I'm gonna do is I'll move you guys. So you end up around about here. And basically, where this cluster of three is, they're um, sort of like clustered over the. Um, Sorry, what did, can you just repeat? I, I didn't hear any of that because it just cut out. Right. So you guys have come out in the chamber, and you can see that the chamber's got a load of ghouls in it. And around the cluster of three ghouls. I can't see no ghouls. I can. Uh, I can barely see some ghouls. 
Right. So where where you can see, see some ghouls, um, the, you, you can see the, the sort of struggling form of the innkeeper's wife. So we'll go to Avenda first. Okay. I can't so you, see... You might not be able to see much until I can't see the yet, so resource goes in. So I'm yeah. going to sprint towards the sound. Could you just ping me where the sound is? Uh, the sound of the screaming is in this sort of this line here. So Okay, so I'm going to move... Bit, if you follow the pings from what you can see. Cool, I'm going to move a square at a time then. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. I'm in pitch blackness. Yeah, that's the problem when the torch is behind you. Yeah, because I... Uh, you, you can hear you can hear loads of like growling and you, you hear sort of like some stuff starting to stalk towards you, but you can't see where okay. it is. I'm gonna stop there and I'm just gonna swing my quarterstaff out in kind of like a blind motion. Yeah, you don't hear anything, but yeah, okay. it's a good idea. You 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 hear something move back slightly at the the motion, but you you don't hear anything. Okay, can I spend a key point to have my um, patient defense up, please? You can do. What does that do? Uh, I can use a dodge as a bonus action. Cool. So I've got five left. My turn's uh, over. The, the only downside of that is it may require you to see your opponent to use dodge. Possibly, yeah. Um, dragon. Um, so I'm going to cast Shield of Faith on myself and then go towards where Avinda vanished. Yep. So about here, I think. Yep. Um, and just keep my shield in front of me and sort of call out into the darkness. So is anyone there? So what I'll do is I'll give you guys both um, like five foot of light. Just so you can kind of see immediately around you. Cool. Um, so the ghouls go. So ghouls move in here. Um, the other three continue to... You can hear like screams from the, the innkeeper's wife. Um, first two um, claw at Matty. What's your AC, Matty? It's 13 now. Uh, first one misses, second one hits. For seven points of damage, and you have to make a constitution check. Okay. And then the attack against Greg. Cool. I'm going to deck save with advantage using my dodge. Yep. Okay, it's a 21. So does that half damage, or does it completely? Um... But, uh, attack. Uh, any attack will get made against me is with disadvantage if I can see him. Uh, and you make dexterity th saving throws. Oh, sorry. I make dex saving throws with advantage, but you have disadvantage against me. Right, cool. So I've got disadvantage for the, his attack. 17 still hits. Um, and he oh, no, misses. Sorry. Cool. Um, Quail. Uh, oh, well, sorry. Bet you're glad you picked night vision now or dark vision now. Oh fuck. Uh, sorry, I just messed What's up something. Quiet. Um, uh, can I cast? Uh, fuck. Um, I would like to cast daylight. Um, I would like to cast daylight. Uh. There. I can't do anything. Just click and hold. There. So. Uh, nice. So. Can you yeah. guys see now? Yep. Yeah. Um, I get a bonus action. Can I? use the spiritual weapon. 
isn't that isn't the bonus attack to attack with it when it's actually cast because you've not cast it yet? Uh, spiritual weapon says you create a floating spectral weapon within range that lasts for the duration or until you cast the spell again. When you cast a spell, you can make a melee spell attack against a creature within five feet of the weapon. On a hit, the target takes force damage equal to one d8 plus your spell casting ability modifier. So, no, if it doesn't mention bonus action, then uh, it is is a bonus action. Casting time is one bonus action. Oh, yeah, so you you can uh, can do that. Uh, Yeah, so I guess I'll do that. Um, Hold on. Um, I will do it on the, this one. Yep. So you make a melee spell attack, which will be... Uh, I assume you've missed on the melee spell attack, though, because that would have been the eight. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you've missed, So you, but, but you've got those thing conjured now, so you can use bonus actions to attack a game with it each turn. Without interrupting your main what casting, um, Von Hilda. Yes, so I'll move to say there, um, and then for my um, main action, can I cast enemies bound on the ghast at the back there? Mm-hmm. Which does? Um, I just had it open. All right. So, because it's in Zamfars, so I don't think it's on the thing. Sorry. Yeah, what's the spell called? Sorry, uh, enemies are bound. So, uh, you reach into the mind of one creature you can see and force it to make an intelligent saving throw. The creature automatically succeeds; it's immune to being frightened. On a failed save, the creature loses the target loses the ability to distinguish friend from foe. Regarding all creatures it can see as enemies until the spell ends. Each time a target takes damage, it can repeat the saving throw and ending with effect on itself on success. Whenever the affected creature chooses another target, another creature as a target, it must choose a target at random from among the creatures it can see within range of an attack spell or other ability it's using. If an enemy provokes an attack form opportunity from the affected creature, the creature must make that attack if it is able to. So... Yep, cool. Um, so it makes an int saving throw. I presume the DC will be my spell DC. 15, yeah. yeah. Angus and 18. Okay. Well, what can you do? Um, and then as my bonus action, I'll. I presume Matty's still not um, lost my, my bardic inspiration, hasn't he? Uh, still within 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, so he's still got it. In that case, I'll give it to Avender. Nice, thank you. Yep. And top of the round, Avender. Okay, uh, I'm going to attack this. Uh, is it a ghast in front of me? Uh, yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna take. I'm gonna start swinging my quarter stuff. Actually, can... because you guys have started turns in combat with the ghast. Uh... Is it a con save? Actually, no. You guys, you guys made the saves last time, so you're immune to the effect of the ghast. Cool. Smell, so you're f- you okay? Cool. So I'm going to start baseball batting. Uh, yep, yeah, 11 points of damage. Mate. 20 points of damage, so 23. And what then... do they call the baseball bats in Fallout 4? Is it like the slugger or something? <laughs> slugger. <laughs> and then I'm going to. Uh, right, so you hit twice. What, Is it still up? Action as well? Is it still, up? still alive? Hot damn. Okay, um, I'm not going to spend anything, so I'm just going to do a uh, a headbutt. And it's still up. Damn. 27. Uh, dragon. Okay, uh, so the gas is still up, so I'll hit it with my Warhammer. Yep. Um, and... I'll use smite as well. Mm. 
Uh, yeah, the gas dead. And that used a level one spell slot for me. Yep. Um, then I'll hit the one here. Yep. Uh, that kills it. All the chaos. Oi. Uh, that's the end of my turn. Uh, cool. The eagles. Um, so these ghouls now sort of realise what's going on, and they um, one of them stays on the um, the wife of the innkeeper, and the other two come over to join into the fray. Um, so ghoul on that. Uh, Sixteen. Yeah, that'll hit. Uh, four points of damage. Uh, Ghast on Avender. Misses. Wait. Ghoul on Avender. Misses. Um, Quail. Um, can I actually see the Ghast, which is to the right of Avinder. It's in yes. combat with Avinder, so if you shoot, it'll be at disadvantage. So I'll be at disadvantage. Yes. Right. Because you're shooting into combat. Uh, okay. I will shoot. Same, bear in mind the same applies to spell effects, which you've got an attack roll. Because it's like firing a bow, effectively. So if, if it's got an attack roll... So in order to hit, you have to roll a d20 plus something, then it counts oh, as a yeah, ranged yeah. attack. If it's a spell which has got an automatic effect, like magic missile, then that always hits. It doesn't have a... All right, okay. Um, I'll do guiding bolt uh, on this one. Yep, so you got so you use the lowest of those two. So, uh, so you got a 20, so you still hit. Um, and you do 20 radiant damage, which kills it. That is nice. Cool. Um, Van Hilda. Cool. So, um, I'll just cast uh, Witch Bolt at the um, ghoul at the back there. Yeah. So, level one. You hit, you do uh, just three points of damage. Yep. Uh, you distract, it sort of stops attacking the um, the innkeeper's wife and turns towards you guys. Cool. And next up we have Dragon. Okay. Um, I'll sort of step over the corpse of the ghast and then hit the ghast that's in front of Avinda. Is the um, that one out for that. Um, is the one behind you still alive? Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, roll. Uh, just did. Oh, sorry. 13. Uh, yep, yeah, hits. Uh, Thirteen bludgeoning. Uh, yeah, that's enough to kill it because it's already been quite hurt by. Um, and then I saw just backhand the one that I've walked past. <laughs> you got a shield, so. Um, I don't think that one's been hit yet. So, still up. And I'll smite. Oops, wrong one. Nice. <laughs> <That> one. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, what? It's, it's 2d8 radiant damage and then plus an extra 7 against undead, so yeah, it's dead. Boom. Boom. Uh, there's one left. We'll just, I think we'll just say that you finish off the remaining one. Since there's only one left. Cool. So you, you kind of you rush over and you can kind of see that the innkeeper's wife's lying there. All her clothes are like torn and ragged. She's got some <laughs> quite deep claw wounds uh, on her body where she's been clawed. Um, so I'll try and use lay on hands on her. What part of the body are you laying your hands on? Uh, wherever's injured. <laughs> <laughs> uh, roll for healing. Um, it's just it's a pool. So I can yep. heal up to 30 points. 
so you reckon five to uh, six poisons and disease. Yeah, so you reckon six points will, will, will get her back to pretty much full health. She'll still be obviously um, sort of uh, frightened and um, affected by the thing, but you can, six points will do enough to bring her back to full health. Okay, uh, that including, uh, if, well, I don't, wouldn't know if she's infected or anything like that, would I? Uh, no, uh, you can make a, if you've got detect disease, I think one of you do. Uh, I do not. I Maybe have, no someone is deceased. I have, uh, detects poisons and disease. So. so you could cast that if you wanted to see if she's been infected by the ghoul or not. I will cast that. Do I detect she, she's been poisoned or she has not? She's been lucky and she passed her saves. So no, she's not. <laughs> um. So yeah. So you you you. It seems to be that you've killed most of the ghouls that are in here. Um. What do you want to do? Do you want to search the remaining place or do you want to escort the innkeeper's wife out? Can we I'm grabbing go? a torch and looking around. Can we yeah. go back and look in the other room, which the other path which we walk well, past? Do you want to clear out the bits we can see around? Yeah, I first? mean, basically, you should. Be, the, the you, you, I mean, I think the, the rest of the place is empty, so you can look around if you want through the I'll start, through the actual place. I'll start escorting her back up. Yeah. So um, there's various like you'll you'll notice there's various um, pathways up. They lead into the ruins around the inn, so the different sort of village buildings. So this seems to be like almost like a, a series of like burial chambers beneath the actual vi what was the village. Um, you don't find any other ghouls. Um, I think you probably find very minor amounts of coins, so maybe twenty gold coins between you. Um, you know, just like little bits that have been left with people's um, departed ones, etc. But there's nothing that stands out as being magical or. All right. If it's anything. on like essentially burial stuff, I won't take that. Yeah, I mean... Yep. Uh, you get back up to the innkeeper and you can kind of see the guards are all organising themselves to go down and help you guys. Um, the the barons are out basically just sort of coordinating with them. He's making, getting them torches and stuff like that and ordering them to go down and assist you guys just as you're coming up. So as, as I'm sort of like leading her up um, with my arm around her sort of supporting her weight, fear not, she's okay, everything's fine. And so the Baron's sort of asking you, so, so what was it? Infestation of ghouls, I believe. But Did you get them all? I think so. My uh, my party, the, the other people you've hired, they're still looking. So he sends half the guards down to help, like, carry out a thorough um, search of the, of the, uh, the underground area, basically. Oh my god, there's three more ghouls. Four, three more ghouls! Yeah. Then well, once you guys have got back out and... Um, that was just where I was dumping the tokens, and got um, back to the surface. The the Baron also sends down some of the workmen to repair the to sort of barricade up the entrance into the catacombs more securely. Um, and the innkeeper is obviously very appreciative, and he he, he basically um, he sort of arranges a much uh, larger sort of breakfast feast almost to celebrate the fact that you'd managed to save his wife. Can I just go uh, to the toilet real quick? No. Well, in game. No. Yeah, I mean... she's in front of him, Mike. Uh, I think we'll probably just call it here anyway, actually, because it's uh, quarter past ten now anyway. So, as well. cool. Uh, we'll call it here. Uh, so, I think there's probably a fair gap before you can make it again, Greg, isn't there? There is. Uh, the next time I can start is the week starting the 27th of August. Yeah, because I fly out on Friday for a couple of weeks. Right. So, should we aim for Wednesday the 29th? I could do that. Yeah, he's yeah. not sure if I'm working then or not, but I'll only know about that like a week before or something like that. Right, so I'll put something into the chat, uh, Facebook thing again, and then if people can just confirm back. Yep. I'd say we're using milestone experience, so you, um, you'll get you'll go up a level at certain points during the adventure. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. Hope you enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah. that's really good. Thanks, Dave. Right. Cheers, Dave. Right. See you all in a bit. Cheers, Bye. Bye. Bye.